Hello and welcome to One Tennessee's Academic Detailing Training, where we seek to promote patient safety and better health through education about safe management of pain and opioid therapy. We work in collaboration with organizations and agencies at local, state, and national levels to improve the health and safety of patients through education and promotion of evidence-based clinical best practices. My name's Brian Wimbigler, and I'll be your host throughout this training. This training has been approved for both pharmacy and medical PA, NP, and nursing credits. So at the conclusion of this, we'll provide instructions on how to claim your CE credits. First, let's meet the team. There were several collaborators that helped pull this presentation together. They're listed below and none of the presenters or members of the planning committee have any relevant disclosures to make. We have Mr. Ron Evans, Ms. Lisa Jenkins, Dr. Sharon Moore, Dr. Jason Vinson, and myself, Brian Winbigler. So to get started, let's talk about what a substance use disorder is in general so that we all start with the baseline understanding. So a substance use disorder is basically a maladaptive pattern of substance use. So that means using anything, it could be alcohol, it could be opioids, it could be a stimulant product, but anything that is now causing negative consequences in your daily life in a period of about 12 months. So that would be things that cause you to miss baseball practices for your kids, showing up late for work, missing work, anything that disrupts your daily life and has negative consequences. It's also very important to notice that dependence and addiction have been used interchangeably, but they're actually two very different things. So dependence is that physical reliance on a substance, and this can be from normal use, using an opioid as prescribed, for example, Anyone who takes an opioid as prescribed one to two tablets every four to six hours as needed after three to four days will develop some degree of physical dependence. The downside of that is if you're treating pain and you stop taking that medication and a patient isn't aware of this physical dependence, what they do know is when they stop taking it, they might feel bad. And is that because of the physical dependence or mild withdrawal? or is that because of untreated or undertreated pain? But what the patient does identify with is when they take another tablet or they use an opioid pain medication, they feel better. So that's kind of how that happens. And then the addiction side, that is when it's taken to the next level where that physical dependence transitions to addiction to where that reward center, that dopamine pathway has been activated and then that's when people are seeking that drug for that euphoric feeling. They're not only physically dependent, they're also psychologically dependent. Let's take a quick look at substance use disorders in the context of the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. So here's a listing of roughly 11 things that contribute to the diagnosis of a substance use disorder. So briefly take a look at those and you can kind of look at yourself in the context of these, maybe someone you know, maybe some of the patients that you work with, and this will help you kind of categorize where they fall on that continuum in terms of how severe a substance use disorder may be. It's also important to note that in trying to soften the language and reduce stigma surrounding substance use disorders in general, number three, legal problems has been changed to cravings. Legal problems typically carries a negative connotation is somewhat stigmatized, and it's not the legal problems that are really the issue. It's those uncontrolled cravings that are causing people to break the law and perform illicit activities associated with their pursuit of a specific drug of choice. The DSM-5 for substance use disorders encompasses 10 separate classes of drugs. You can see them listed here, and alcohol is at the top of the list. 
While we're not going to specifically focus on alcohol much during this presentation, most of the focus is going to be on opioids specifically, it's really good to point out that worldwide, alcohol is absolutely king in terms of substance use disorders. It's widely available, it's socially acceptable, and it's been around for a really long time. So alcohol, in terms of all substance use orders, is still the number one. So it's the king. We're not going to talk much about it, but I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that although we're focusing on opioids and, and talking about stimulants and those type things, alcohol is king when it comes to substance use disorders. Also on the list there is caffeine. So caffeine is one of those benign substances. And my example with caffeine is I would turn myself physically dependent on caffeine. Now that doesn't mean that I have a caffeine substance use disorder because it's not causing me to miss my kids baseball games. I don't miss work. But if I don't have my morning cup of coffee by about 10, 1030, I might be getting a small headache. And that's my body telling me, hey, buddy, you better get your caffeine this morning. So that's one of those physical manifestations of basically a withdrawal symptom. So I need my morning cup of coffee. I don't typically drink caffeine throughout the day, but if I don't have that morning cup, my body lets me know about it. Let's look at some other specific definitions to further lay the groundwork for the rest of the presentation. So looking specifically at substance use disorder, what I really want you to focus on is that it's a primary chronic neurobiological disease. So just like cholesterolemia, hypertension, other chronic diseases that we're familiar with, diabetes, those type things, substance use disorders are chronic neurobiological diseases. So we need to kind of reframe and change how we think about them. And when we're talking about medications for opioid use disorder or MAT and those type things, I get questions all the time, how long should someone be on a replacement product? Or how long should someone be in treatment? Well, basically, how long should someone be treated for their diabetes or their hypertension? Until they don't have high blood sugar anymore. Until they don't have high blood pressure. So in terms of how long should you treat someone with a substance use disorder, that varies, just like it would vary with any patient being treated with for any chronic disease. Drug misuse, this is kind of an easy one. This is just using anything for an unintended purpose. So a non-therapeutic effect, that could be euphoria, you name it, but that's just taking anything for a non-medical purpose. Tolerance, we've kind of talked about this one a little bit. Um, tolerance and dependence kind of go hand in hand, but tolerance, that's something really unique and specific to opioids because opioids don't have a ceiling effect, meaning that doses will have to escalate indefinitely to maintain the same level of pain control. So if you're on opioids, the longer you're on them, you won't be able to stay on the same dose. You'll have to increase that dose to continue to maintain that pain control and that treatment. So your body develops a tolerance and those escalate, those opioid doses will escalate indefinitely. So that's why we have high potency products like fentanyl for intractable, uncurable cancer pain and those type things. We've already touched on dependence with my example using caffeine. And I've mentioned that people taking opioids legally prescribed one to two tablets every four to six hours, after about three or four days, regardless of body size and composition, everyone's gonna develop some degree of physical dependence on that opioid product. The negative side of that is the withdrawal. And that can happen, and those are, with caffeine for me, it's a headache. It can be any kind of unpleasant symptoms after abrupt cessation, a rapid dose reduction, or decreasing drug concentrations. Or in the context of an opioid overdose and someone being rescued by naloxone or Narcan, that can put someone into a withdrawal immediately because of that antagonistic effect of that product. Drug overdose, that's just an intentional or unintentional acute super therapeutic dose of any kind of drug substance. You can drink too much water and dilute your blood enough to put you into a lethal arrhythmia. 
So too much of just about anything can cause negative consequences. Unintentional drug overdose deaths, this is a big one, and this is really being driven by the addition of ultra-potent sub substances mixed in with other drugs. So fentanyl, for example, fentanyl mixed in with heroin, fentanyl laced in marijuana and other products. A user can think they're using one thing and actually overdose because of the potent opioid effect of fentanyl and other fentanyl analogs like acetyl fentanyl and carfentanyl. Addiction, this is when someone has moderate to severe uh, opioid or substance use disorder as characterized by the DSM-5. So they've got six, seven, eight of those 11 categories on that list. They're using despite negative consequences and they're psychologically, in addition to physically, dependent on a specific drug substance. I've mentioned that substance use disorders are a disease. And when you look at the definition of a disease, it's basically a disorder of structure or function that produces specific signs or symptoms or that affects a specific location and is not simply a direct result of physical injury. So in terms of a substance use disorder, this is brain dysfunction. And it's something that's chronic and it's gonna take a long time to heal. To avoid getting too complex with brain function, we're gonna look at it as just being three different parts. So that first part that develops in the womb and develops first is that reptilian complex. That's your instincts. That controls a lot of your autonomic functions that you don't think about. Breathing, blinking, all of those type things. It also houses part of our reward pathway. So we're gonna be rewarded for doing things that are gonna keep us alive. So when we're thirsty and we drink, it feels good. When we're hungry and we eat, that feels good. When we're cold and we find warmth and shelter, that feels good. So this part of the brain is rewarding us for doing those things that are gonna help keep us alive. Then you've got the limbic system, and that houses our emotions. So Basically, looking back in the caveman days, that might have been when we figured out, hey, it's easier to hunt when we're together in groups. It's easier to survive when we work together. So that's that social connection. Those are those warm feelings that you feel with social interaction. And then the most advanced part that really separates us from a lot of other mammals on the planet is our advanced neocortex. So that's your frontal lobe that gives you the ability to reason. So that's reasoning what's right and wrong. Um, the ability to see forward in time, if I do this, this will happen. So our reasoning, judgment, and empathy, that's housed there in the neocortex. The driving force behind this reward pathway is the feel-good chemical dopamine. So when you're hungry and you eat, that's 150% release of dopamine. So dopamine's that chemical that's released to reward us for doing things that are gonna keep us alive. And if you look at that list, one of the highest natural releases is sex. So if you think about that, we have to procreate to prolong the human species. So we're rewarded for activities that are going to keep us persistent through time. So looking further down on that list, if the highest release you can get naturally is roughly 200%, look at amphetamine and methamphetamine. 1,000 and 1,300% release. So when you think about that reward pathway designed to reward us for doing things that are going to keep us alive, when you have something that hits with such force and opioids are between 800 and 1100, that now is what your brain believes is the most important thing that you need for survival. So it starts rewiring the way your brain works. I mentioned that really high levels of dopamine release can change or rewire the way the brain works. And this is an illustration to kind of show you what I mean when I say that. So this is a PET scan of the brain. So just radio, radio labeled sugar, it travels to the brain and it lights up and shows where the brain is active. So the light bright colors are representative of brain activity and darker colors are representative of brain inactivity. 
So looking at the top line there, you see that's a normal brain and there's lots of activity. So there's a lot of lit up areas. That middle row, that is someone who's been misusing or abusing cocaine for about 10 days straight. So that's releasing a lot of dopamine. And if you look there, the parts of the brain that are no longer lit up are the frontal lobe, the top part of the brain. So if you see there, the back part or that reptilian complex, your reward pathway, that is still lit up. That will remain lit up. It will continue to work no matter what, that most basic part of the brain. But our frontal lobe that provides us with reasoning and judgment is now turned off. That last row there, that's after 100 days of complete abstinence. And you can see the frontal lobe slowly starts having activity. So when you look at this, one of the things that I really struggled with when I started working with patients that were suffering from substance use disorders is why don't you just stop? If you know you're gonna lose your kids, you've lost your house, you're living out of your car, you've been in jail, and all of this is driven by a substance use disorder and addiction, why don't you just put it down? And it's because they can't. This frontal lobe is no longer functioning and it's not connected to the back part of the brain and it can't override those intense cravings. So patients and people can think, I don't want to do this. I need to change my life. They can think about not using but this frontal lobe no longer has the ability to override those intense cravings for that drug product. Because remember, now that basic part of the brain thinks that substance is necessary for survival. So that's a really important concept to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about patients that are suffering from a substance use disorder. Here's another look at how the reward pathway works in the brain. So you'll notice on the left side, the non-addicted brain, the biggest circle is the control. That is your fully functional frontal lobe. That controls the drive. It's the biggest part. So when you think about a fully functioning frontal lobe, you can override those basic autonomic functions. So as you sit here and you're listening to this, you can cognitively, if you've got a fully functioning frontal lobe, you can hold your breath and you may even pass out, but you will wake up breathing, I promise you, because this front part has gone to sleep and that back part never sleeps. You can have a staring contest and keep your eyes open as long as you possibly can. You can hold them open, but I promise you, you will eventually blink because eyes and eyesights are very necessary for survival. So it's gonna be, you can control some things with your frontal lobe when it's functioning. When you look over on the right side in that addicted brain, that reward and drive are now the biggest parts. And you'll see the memory is bigger too. So these go hand in hand. So just, we'll use caveman for example. When you found water, you needed to remember where that water was. So with each dopamine release, there's an equally large memory created around that event. So when you find food, you found a fruit bearing tree, you need to remember where that was. You also need to remember how to get back to your cave for shelter. So there are memories created around these. So when you misuse a substance and you have an ultra high release of dopamine, there is an equally proportional memory made surrounding that event. So another way to look at those memories, those are the intense cravings. So those are those thoughts, those feelings that were surrounding that drug use that is driving this person now. So the reward, the memory, the drive, those are all larger than this fully functioning frontal lobe was in the left side. So now it's not attached. Every time that big hard dopamine hits, this frontal lobe says, uh-oh, there's something wrong back there. I shouldn't be hit with this much dopamine. I'm gonna start down-regulating receptors and cutting off from that part of the brain. So it takes a long time for this part to reconnect to that back part. And you can see in this picture, 
you've got a dotted line, it's the smallest circle, and patients no longer have the willpower and the control because their brain isn't working properly to override those cravings and stop their drug use. So I mentioned the memory problem. The hippocampus and amygdala store information about environmental cues associated with the desired substance so that it can be located again. Memories create a conditioned response. That's those intense cravings that I mentioned. They're almost uncontrollable and people have to have that substance because now the brain thinks that's the one thing that they need, to pr they need for survival. This contributes not only to addiction, but also return to use or relapse. There are things that can trigger return to use. A person addicted to heroin can be triggered just by simply seeing a hypodermic needle that will trigger those intense cravings and those memories surrounding their use and cause them to seek out more heroin or another opioid product to quell those cravings that they're experiencing. When you look at the pictures on this slide, I promise you no one wakes up one day, looks in the mirror and says, I can't wait for my face to be scarred. I can't wait to lose my teeth. No one wakes up saying, I can't wait to put a needle in my arm. No one wakes up saying, you know what? I can't wait to lose my kids. I can't wait to lose my house. I'm, I can't wait to overdose. They don't do this. They would love to stop. They would like to stop. Most people, some aren't there yet, but when you get this far along in the addiction, the drug is just there because of the physical dependence. They just need it to survive. Most people aren't even getting the euphoric effects anymore. And when you look at the faces of a meth misuser or abuser after 10 years, look at that from age 28 to age 37. I promise you, no one goes in to misusing or abusing a substance with this intent in mind. They get addicted, their brain is changed, they can't stop because it's a neurological brain disease. The frontal lobe, although they can think they want to stop, it's not powerful enough to override those cravings and it takes a long time for the brain to heal. Substance misuse among young people is even more concerning because up until age 25, the frontal lobe isn't fully developed. And when you're misusing a substance, that frontal lobe development is essentially arrested or delayed at time of first use. So younger people misusing and abusing drugs, this can have long lasting, lifelong consequences. And these people are more likely to struggle or develop a substance use disorder in the future. We've been talking about the role of the frontal lobe, the reward pathway, dopamine is a feel-good chemical, memories that are created that are also uh, cause those intense cravings. There's other factors that can play into how a person might be predisposed to developing a substance use disorder. And one of those primary drivers are adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences change the way the brain works because people that are experiencing these things are in a constant state of fight or flight. So that changes the relationship between that frontal lobe and that reward way pathway in their brain. And we know that people that experience adverse childhood experiences are more likely to struggle with substance use disorders in the future. We know that people who have suffered adverse childhood experiences have more negative outcomes later on in life that include injury, mental health issues like depression and anxiety, maternal health, unintended pregnancy and pregnancy complications leading to fetal death. There's higher incidences and rates of HIV and STDs. Also, there's a direct link to chronic disease like cancer and diabetes. Risky behaviors, that falls right in line with developing a substance use disorder, using alcohol and drugs, misusing those, unsafe sex practices, 
And then there's also a link between adverse childhood experiences and educational opportunities. Fewer people go on to college and have advanced degrees. So what are ACEs? So adverse childhood experiences are stressful or traumatic events, including abuse and neglect, and they're strongly related to development and prevalence of a wide range of other health problems. We've touched on some of those, and these are what the ACEs include. So when you look at abuse, that can be physical, emotional, sexual, overt neglect, that can be physical or emotional, household dysfunction, so that can be mental illness in the house, incarcerated relatives. Just imagine a child in a home and law enforcement comes in and removes their parents. That's a traumatic, traumatic event. Um, a mother treated violently, divorce, substance abuse in the family. So when you look at this, these are all really bad things that can be happening around children. And when you look at children, they don't have a lot of control over who their parents are, where they live, where they go to school, and they're relatively powerless to prevent a lot of these abuses. When you look at behavioral consequences, lack of physical activity, people that suffer from adverse childhood experiences tend to smoke more than those that don't experience ACEs, alcoholism, drug use, missed work, those physical and mental health issues. There's more incidence of severe obesity and diabetes, obviously depression. Think about that list of all those negative things and how that would cause a deep-seated depression. Suicide attempts. Remember, children, one of the only things that they might feel like they have control over is themselves, and they might attempt suicide as a way out of that environment. STDs, loose sexual practices. This can also be because they're more predisposed to try and experiment with drugs, so those inhibitions are reduced. Heart disease, cancer, increased stroke risk, COPD, and broken bones, primarily secondary to traumatic events from car crashes, falls, all subsequent to cognitive issues and inebriation. Uh, secondary to substance use disorders. So all of these are really negative things. When we look at ACEs, they're a lot more common than we re originally thought. On average, 28% of adults report physical abuse and 21% report sexual abuse. The sexual abuse is likely underreported because that is so traumatic and so embarrassing and makes the person feel so terrible that it's hard to share that information. ACEs also tend to cluster. So if you look at that list, if there's a few bad things going on, there's probably a lot of bad things going on in that environment. So almost 40% of adults reported two or more ACEs and 12 and a half experienced four or more. So why are those numbers important? Because someone that experiences four or more ACEs is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. If they have five or more, they're seven to 10 times more likely to use illicit drugs. And then with six or more, they're almost 50 times more likely to be an IV drug misuser than someone with no ACEs. So ACEs are absolutely a factor in how someone develops and can manage a substance use disorder. Taking a look at 100 American adults, when you break this out, those with no ACEs over there on the left side, they have much better outcomes than those on the far right side with seven or more ACEs. If you go down to the bottom row, someone with no ACEs, you're gonna see about one in 96 attempt suicide. On the right side, that jumps to one in five people. So this isn't a benign thing. We know there's direct links to negative outcomes. So it's really important that when you're working with people that have a substance use disorder, that you get an ACEs score to help you better identify and know those underlying factors that might have contributed to them developing a substance use disorder. 
This slide lays out a brief history of controlled substances, and we know that some substances are more prone to misuse and abuse than others. So what I want to do is let's just jump down to the Controlled Substance Act that was established in 1970 and talk about what that means and specific drug classes. So we'll start with Schedule 1. So the lower the schedule or the lower the number, the more prone to misuse and abuse. So Schedule 1, these are drugs that have no medically accepted use in the U.S. or lacks accepted safety for use and treatment under medical supervision. So those are things like LSD, heroin. While LSD is being used in some clinical trials to treat PTSD, there's not a whole lot of research behind its medical use, and it's still a Schedule 1. Heroin, that's also a Schedule 1. Originally introduced in 1897 by the Bayer Company, it wasn't always a, an illegal substance, but now it is because of, we are more aware of its misuse and abuse potential. Then we move to Schedule II. So Schedule II drugs have a really high potential for misuse and abuse. So things on this list are morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, amphetamines like Adderall, Dexedrine, Vyvanse, methylphenidate like Ritalin, and cocaine. So when you look at this list, we do have legal heroin. Heroin is an opioid. It's just in a pharmaceutical form like morphine, oxycodone, or hydrocodone. So when you look at the stimulants, we've got methamphetamine. That's a Schedule One because it's highly abused and misused, legal forms of that would be Schedule II in the form of amphetamines and methylphenidate. So we do have medicinal uses for substances, but they're regulated, they're controlled, they're prescribed by a physician, they're dispensed by a pharmacist, and they're strictly controlled under the C2 designation. Moving on to Schedule III, these have a potential for misuse and abuse, but much less than a C2 drug. So this misuse may lead to moderate or low physical dependence or high psychological dependence. The main thing here is these can be refilled five times within a six month period. You can phone in these prescriptions. This also includes codeine with acetaminophen, so Tylenol number three, and anabolic steroids and testosterone fall into this category. The difference between C3 and C2, most C2s, or all C2s for that example, they need to be sent electronically. There are no refills. They have to be filled 30 out of 30 days. And a physician can write for up to 90 days, but those need to be in three successive 30-day prescriptions. So unlike Schedule 3s that can be phoned in and written with up to five refills in a six-month period, Schedule 2s can't be used that way. So that's a major difference between Schedule 2 and Schedule 3. Moving on to Schedule 4, these have low potential for abuse relative to substances in Schedule 3 and Schedule 2, and these lead to limited physical dependence or psychological dependence. These can be filled five times within a six-month period, and some common examples are your benzodiazepines, Soma, a muscle relaxant, not really used that much anymore, and tramadol. So those are all examples of some C4 drugs that you may be familiar with. Schedule 5, the misuse and abuse potential is declining even more. These can be uh, prescription or OTC drugs. Some codeine containing cough syrups fall into this category. Lamotyl, uh, pregabalin or Lyrica falls into the Schedule 5 category. So these are some examples. And as the schedule increases in number, the misuse and abuse potential declines. Substance misuse and abuse is tracked in the United States, primarily using the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. There's a lot of numbers on this slide, but the one that I want to call your attention to is that third bullet point down. Two in five young adults aged 18 to 25, or almost 40%, reported using an illicit substance in the previous year. The reason that is so concerning is remember, up until age 25, that frontal lobe where we get our reasoning and judgment isn't fully developed. And what's more concerning is the development of the frontal lobe is arrested or slowed at time of first use 
depending on how frequently and what substance our adolescents are using. So that's incredibly concerning. If you look down at that last bullet point, almost 40 million adults aged 26 and older, I'm not worried about any adult over the age of 25 really developing a new onset substance use disorder. For example, if marijuana were legalized tomorrow, I'm not worried about an adult developing a marijuana use disorder because we have fully functioning frontal lobes and we have the ability to say, oh, you know what? I think I've smoked too much weed today. I have got to go to work. The difference between us and children is they don't have a fully functioning frontal lobe and they are less likely to be able to put that substance down and that dopamine keeps coming in and it just exacerbates their substance use disorder and their dependence on whatever drug they're using at the time. We're talking a lot about substance use disorders and we've gone through the controlled substance list which of the following do you think is the most misused substance? Is it stimulants like cocaine, uh, medications for ADHD, methamphetamine? Is it pain medications or depressant type drugs like hydrocodone, oxycodone, heroin, fentanyl, etc.? Is it marijuana, joints, edibles, vapes, concentrates? Or is it sedatives like those benzodiazepines, um, sleeping medications like Lunesta? So which of these do you guys think it is? Well, this is the one. So marijuana is by far the most used, most used and misused substance currently. So you can see here that marijuana dwarfs the majority of the other drugs on this list with 48.2 million reports of its use in the previous year. Now, that could be a direct result of a lot of legislative changes and societal changes in the way we view marijuana. It's legal in some states, it's not in other states. It's becoming more socially acceptable, so people may be more willing to report their use of marijuana than they have in the past, but just basically looking at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the majority of the misused substances reported involve marijuana. You can also see a close second, well not a close second, but second on the list is prescription, prescription pain reliever misuse. And we talk a lot about heroin and those type drugs when we're talking about opioid use disorder and fatal overdoses. But if you look, it's at the bottom of this list. That could be because there's a lot of stigma associated with freely reporting that. But if you just take the survey at its face value, the most commonly misused substance is marijuana. This slide is looking at initiation of drug misuse. So how many people started using a substance in the previous year? So remember, alcohol's king. So that tops the list. And then when you look on the list, those two top ones, those are things that are legal. So alcohol is legal to purchase, cigarettes are legal to purchase. And the thing that really blows my mind about 1.6 million people starting to smoke cigarettes, and these are incendiary cigarettes. So tobacco that you light with a lighter and you smoke, this does not include vaping products. Um, we're seeing a huge uptick in that. But we know, everyone knows that cigarettes are bad for you. Yet 1.6 million people chose to start smoking in the previous year. Then you look down and these are illicit uses or illegal type products. Now prescription pain reliever medications are legal, legally prescribed by a physician and dispensed by a pharmacy, but this is diversion and illegal use or misuse. So marijuana, again, is at the top of the list and heroin's at the bottom of the list. So when you're looking at these, remember alcohol is king. We know cigarettes are bad, but people still choose to start smoking. And then marijuana is the number one reported new start for illicit products. Let's dive in and look more specifically at the opioid epidemic. 
So on this slide, what you're looking at is this is all-cause mortality in terms of deaths per 100,000 people. So you can see that the rest of the world is trending down in terms of all-cause mortality, and the U.S. is trending up. Now, why is this? I would argue that our medical technology and advancements are just as good as the rest of the world. So why are we seeing an uptick in mortality? Taking a look at what's driving our death rate, when you look at this, we're doing pretty good with the treatment of chronic disease states. We're doing great with cancer treatment, specifically lung cancer. We're seeing a really great decline there. Suicides have ticked down. Chronic liver disease has leveled off. Diabetes has remained relatively consistent. But when you look at this, poisonings are driving our death rate. And this includes every call to the Poison Control Center, including things that you might see on TikTok, the Tide Pod Challenge and other things that kids are doing. But what we're specifically talking about here that's driving our death rate are opioid-induced respiratory depressions and overdose. This slide does a great job to kind of detail and highlight how legislative changes can have unintended consequences. So if anyone remembers what happened back on October 6, 2014, that is when hydrocodone, one of the most frequently misused and abused opioids, went from a Schedule III substance to a Schedule II substance. Now, the reason that's significant is remember, Schedule III drugs, you can get that initial fill and have five refills so you can get six prescriptions in a six month period. You can also phone in refills for that. So after that six month, you could call your doctor, your doctor could call in another six month supply. So what happened when it went from set schedule three to schedule two, no more phoned in refills. You had to present a written hard copy prescription for every 30 day fill. The physician could only write up to a 90-day supply using three sequential 30-day prescriptions. So all of that, what that did is that shrunk the legal supply that was out there. And if you look at what that did on this slide, you can see right there in October 2014 that the natural semi-synthetic opioids, which are basically the prescribed opioids kind of leveled off just a little bit. And then what you see is a directly proportional increase in synthetic opioids and heroin. Now what's happening there is we had a whole lot of people that were, if not misusing and abusing, were at the very least physically dependent on these drugs. And when that illicit supply was decreased and they no longer had access, they went to things like heroin. This slide just serves to take a closer look at what we looked at on the last slide, and this shows almost a directly proportional decrease in prescription drugs and increase in fentanyl and heroin. So that legal supply was diminished, and when I say legal supply, those were pills written by a physician, filled at a pharmacy, and then most likely diverted or misused in other ways. So when that supply went away, heroin and fentanyl came in to fill that void. Back at the peak of the opioid epidemic in Tennessee, three Tennesseans were dying from an opioid-related overdose daily. Back at in the peak, there were more opioid prescriptions written than there were people living in the state. And when you combined all of the opioids that were out there into morphine milligram equivalents and divided that out, that was enough morphine milligram equivalents for every man, woman, and child in Tennessee to take a five milligram oxycodone tablet with breakfast, lunch, and dinner for six weeks straight. So that kind of details how many legal pills were out there prior to the rescheduling of hydrocodone from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2. Looking back a few years into 2018, there were 6 million painkiller prescriptions in 2018, enough for roughly one for every man, woman, and child in Tennessee. We've gotten better with the Tennessee Together Act and other legislation at limiting those opioid prescriptions that are available. In 2018, 
roughly 1,300 people died of an opioid overdose. And in 2018, the death rate was 19.9 per 100,000 people. And if you break that down across the state in 2018, that was 49 specifically in Shelby County, which is Memphis, 61 in Davidson, which is Nashville, and 74 right here where I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. From 2014 to 2018, heroin overdose deaths increased nearly 150% and fentanyl-related overdose deaths increased by over 975%. So while these numbers are really stark and they sound bad, I promise you the most recent data coming out after the pandemic is even worse. So we still have a lot of work to do in this area. This current opioid epidemic and opioid epidemics of the past have often been associated with heroin. And while heroin is a major player, what's really driving our overdose death rate is the addition of ultra potent opioids like fentanyl into heroin products. So you can see there on the right, there's heroin, carfentanyl, and fentanyl. So those relative amounts in those vials are a lethal dose for an opioid naive person. So someone who doesn't use opioids and hasn't developed any kind of tolerance to opioid products. So you can see there, uh, that's a lethal dose of heroin. On the far right, that's a lethal dose of fentanyl. And in the middle, you can barely see anything in that vial. That's a lethal dose of carfentanyl. So fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin, and carfentanyl is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. So when you look at this, what is carfentanyl used for? Carfentanyl is used for veterinary procedures involving large animals. So zoos would use carfentanyl as an anesthetic to put elephants under for veterinary procedures. So when you look at the relative size and volume of distribution of an elephant compared to you or I, that shows you the relative potency and strength. So if someone thinks that they're using heroin and it actually has fentanyl or carfentanyl mixed in, there, mixed in there, that's when they'll see an opioid-induced respiratory depression and subsequent overdose. So that's one of those unintentional opioid overdose deaths that we're talking about. We're talking a lot about opioids, so this may be an easy question or it might not be an, over, an easy question, but which of the following accounts for the most deaths in our state of Tennessee? Is that opioid related deaths? Is it smoking related? Is it motor vehicle related deaths? Or is it COVID-19 related deaths? The answer may surprise you, but it's smoking. Roughly 11,000 adults die every year in the state of Tennessee from smoking related causes. If you remember back in 2018, roughly 1,300 people died from an opioid related overdose. So if so many more people are dying from smoking, why do we focus so much on the opioid epidemic? And I'll explain more about that on the next slide. When we look at the age distribution for drug related cases, it becomes a little bit more clear why we're so focused on preventing opioid related overdoses when compared to other things like smoking and other chronic diseases. When you think about smoking and heart disease and diabetes and other chronic diseases, they tend to be more insidious and happen over time. And for lack of a better term, by the time small cell lung cancer develops in most people, they're well into their late 50s, early 60s, 70s, and 80s. And for lack of a better term, they're kind of on their way out. When you think about opioid overdoses, these people are taken out of society immediately. They don't have time to get their affairs in order. They don't have time to make sure that a will's in place. They don't have time to say goodbye. They're just gone. And if you look at those green bars, unfortunately, they're the highest in recorded history, and that's the most recent 2020 data. The age range ranges between 25 and 55. And when you look at that, most people when they're in that age range are making the most money they're gonna make in their careers. They have families that depend on them. These are your doctors, your lawyers, your teachers, people who are bagging your groceries at the grocery store, everyone. So when you think about these people just being gone, imagine you have a elementary school aged or middle school aged child 
and they go to school one day and their teacher's just gone and they're not coming back because they died of an opioid overdose. So people are being removed immediately. And what happens to children when their parents are incarcerated due to drug activity or due to an overdose death? Those children, best case scenario, have grandparents that they can live with, but most grandparents didn't plan on financially supporting their grandchildren. They can go into foster care. Well, that might be the next best thing. It's not ideal. Kids need to be with their parents. So this is a societal impact. We all pay for this through our tax dollars, and this is disproportionately removing very productive members of society. When we take a look at where overdose deaths are happening, it might not be where you think. I would have thought these would be in motels and trap houses and dark alleys, but the majority of overdose deaths are happening right at home. So if you think back about adverse childhood experiences, what could be more traumatic than coming into your parents' bedroom and seeing them dead having died of an opioid overdose? So not only is this affecting the user, it affects the entire family. And the majority of these are happening at home. The next most frequent place is in the hospital. And this might be difficult to understand, and it was for me until I talked to some hospital administrators and people that work in the ER. What's happening is people are being rescued with Narcan or Naloxone. Some of these patients are admitted to the hospital and when you're rescued by an antagonist drug or you're going without your opioid or drug of choice, you're in really bad withdrawal and you feel terrible. And the one thing that can make you feel better is that drug of choice. The problem with that is tolerance develops over time and it diminishes relatively quickly. So while they're in the hospital, their tolerance is diminished, but they go back to using their normal dose and then they overdose. So many hospital administrators and treatment programs have adjusted rules. Some of those might be you're not allowed to have visitors for the first week. If my loved one or significant other was an intractable pain due to withdrawal, I would want to give them something that would re relieve their suffering. And oftentimes that's what was happening in the hospital setting. A family member or friend was bringing in an opioid and then that patient was overdosing in the hospital. Then you see things that I would think are more characteristic. Um, hotels rented by the hour, um, someone else's house, not necessarily the decedent's place of residence, a car, a truck stop, outside. So just those other places, but just bear in mind, the majority of these overdoses are happening at home. When we look at the prevalence and what those drugs of choice are, before 2015, top of the list was hydrocodone. And then remember, in October of 2014, that moved from a Schedule 3, where you could phone in refills and get six months at a time. Now it's a Schedule 2, so that's dropped down to number eight on this list. Then in 2015, it was oxycodone, but now, and this is true today, it's fentanyl and those fentanyl analogs are at the top of the list. So opioids are still up there. If you look at the prescription type opioids, Taking a look at the prevalence provided by the National Forensic Laboratory Information System, this is facilitated by the DEA to track the top 10 illicit drug use and trends to inform drug policy and enforcement. We see that at the top of the list are illicit type substances, so methamphetamine, cannabis and THC in most areas, but not all, cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl. So, those are all illicit substances, and you can see the percentages, and that's the majority of what's found. Down there at the bottom, roughly, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, roughly 8% of the drugs that are found are more prescription type drugs. So when you see that's alprazolam, a benzodiazepine, oxycodone, buprenorphine, a drug commonly used to treat opioid use disorder, hydrocodone, amphetamine like Adderall and Vyvanse. Those prescription drugs, while I wish they weren't on the list, they are, but they're at the bottom. 
that just shows that the medical community is more cognizant of the risks associated with prescribing Schedule II drugs and the propensity for misuse and abuse. So we're getting better, and specifically when it comes to opioids, those prescription rates have dropped drastically in our state. When we take a look at the data from across the country divided into West, Midwest, Northeast, and South, for opioid type products, fentanyl, buprenorphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and others, for all regions combined, the total number of samples that contained these was 87,284. Keep that number in mind, 87,284, because in the South alone, where Tennessee is, when it comes to methamphetamine alone, that's 85,744. So just in the South, there's more samples of methamphetamine than there are of fentanyl, buprenorphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and all others combined for the entire country. So that just further highlights, although we are currently in an opioid epidemic, we're on the cusp of a rebound stimulant epidemic as well. Like other slides, red typically indicates something that's not so good. So in this slide, red is indicative of an increase in overdose death rates involving natural and semi-synthetic opioids. And when you look at this map, the lighter color, that's stable. And then the color that's kind of in between the peach type color, that is declining rates involving opioids. So I show you this to kind of overlay this. So when you look at all of these, these are states that have some form of legalized or uh, allowable, whether it's recreational or medicinal marijuana. So states that have some kind of legalized marijuana are either seeing a decrease in opioid involved overdose deaths or are at least stable. Now that should be taken with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean that marijuana is the answer to the opioid epidemic. That's just anecdotal that states that have some legalized form aren't seeing the type or the rate of overdoses that other states are seeing that don't have legalized forms. This just highlights what the national landscape looks like. And for us in Tennessee, there's no program for legal THC. We have the farm bill that allows for hemp with 0.03% THC allowable. But other than that, there's no legalized forms. But take a look at our neighbors to the northeast, Virginia, West Virginia. Um, those areas, rural Appalachia, where arguably the opioid epidemic for our state started and swept from east to west, there's legalized for adult and recreational use in Virginia, which is a bordering state that touches us right in that Appalachian uh, region that's highly susceptible to drug misuse and abuse. So which of the following pairs significantly contributed to and arguably caused our current opioid crisis? Was it a porous border and inexpensive heroin? Was it a 1980 letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine stating that addiction was rare combined with the 2001 JCO pain is considered a fifth vital sign? Was it the introduction of OxyContin in 1995 and aggressive marketing by Purdue Pharma? Or was it doctors writing more opioid prescriptions and pharmacists filling more than what was prescribed? So it was arguably all initiated and revolved around a single letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine that said the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. And one of the quote that was pushed by Purdue Pharma when marketing OxyContin and others was that the risk of addiction is much less than 1%. So this is what the entire opioid epidemic was potentially built off of and fueled by. So what does the actual evidence say? So a recent article in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that when it came to severe chronic back pain or hip or knee osteoarthritis pain, narcotics like opioids specifically were no better clinically than non-opioid choices. So when they 
when they looked at it on a pain scale from 1 to 10, there was a rating of 3.4 for opioids versus 3.3 for non-opioids, which was non-clinically significant. So what this really says is there's no real reason to use a potentially abusable drug or a narcotic that at the bare minimum causes physical dependency when you could use things like combination ibuprofen and Tylenol to treat the pain just as effectively without the risk of misuse and abuse. Another recent article published by the British Medical Journal found that each refill and week of opioid prescription is associated with a large increase in opioid misuse among opioid naive patients. Furthermore, they found that duration of the prescription rather than the initial dosage is more strongly correlated or linked with ultimate misuse in the early post-surgical period. So looking at the graph, out of 100,000 people that are on an opioid for less than a week, roughly 125 are gonna have trouble coming off that drug and potentially developing an opioid use disorder. When you take that out past 13 weeks, out of 100,000 people, that number jumps to 8,000 who are gonna struggle with, at, at the bare minimum, physical dependency, and on the far end of that spectrum, full-blown opioid use disorder. Other re research published in JAMA found that new persistent opioid use after surgery is relatively common, and it's not significantly different between minor and major surgical procedures, but rather more associated and linked with behavioral and pain disorders. So basically what this says is if we can use non-narcotic pain treatments for musculoskeletal pain like NSAIDs and other forms, that would be preferred because it doesn't matter what kind of surgery it is, the propensity to continue using opioid use after these acute episodes is the same. When it comes to treating chronic pain, how do we do it? Where do we turn? The CDC has published guidelines and we're gonna review those now. So the first thing, non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy are preferred for chronic pain. That's pretty much in line with the JAMA articles stating that there's no real reason to use a narcotic when you don't have to. So clinici clinicians should consider opioid therapy only if expected benefits for both pain and function are anticipated to outweigh the risks to the patient. And we know what those risks are, physical dependence that trickles into full-blown misuse and abuse, a subsequent opioid use disorder, and on the far end of that, a potentially fatal overdose. Second, we should establish realistic treatment goals with all patients, including realistic goals for pain and function, and we should consider how therapy would be discontinued if the benefits do not outweigh the risks. So we're oftentimes working with patients and a pain score of zero is not realistic. And if you have a patient that's being treated with opioids who reports a zero pain score, then they're over-medicated. It should be to increase function, not completely eliminate the pain. So clinicians should continue opioid therapy only if there is clinically meaningful improvement in pain and function that outweighs those risks. Before starting and periodically during opioid therapy, be sure to discuss with patients the known risks and realistic benefits of opioid therapy and patient and clinician responsibilities for managing therapy. It's always a good idea to perform a three item pain, enjoyment of life and general activity assessment scale. It's three easy questions to gauge if your patient's getting benefits of opioid therapy. What number best describes your pain on average in the past week with zero being no pain and 10 pain as bad as you can imagine? The second question, what number best describes how during the past week pain has interfered with your enjoyment of life? Zero doesn't interfere at all and 10 completely in interferes and I'm unable to do what I like to do. Three, what number best describes how, during the past week, pain has interfered with your general activity? Zero does not interfere, and 10 completely interferes. So if your patient's not experiencing at least a 30% improvement in pain and function, it might be time to consider alternate treatment modalities and tapering or discontinuing opioids. 
When you're assessing a patient's pain, it's great to be on the same level and have a general understanding of what the pain scale from zero to 10 looks like. So we can do this with these faces. We can do this by listing out what one, two, and three say, very mild, discomforting, tolerable, and then giving some examples of what that might look like. So to be able to assess pain, you need to make sure that your patients understand the pain scale, how it's used, and what some common definitions are. When starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, clinicians should prescribe immediate release opioids first instead of extended release or long acting opioids. You need to prescribe the immediate release first so that you can figure out what their cum cumulative total daily dose should be. It's kind of like insulin. You wanna figure out what their needs are and then add a long acting controller medication and then you can still have that short acting for those breakthrough times. So always start with immediate release first to appropriately and accurately gauge how many morphine milligram equivalents a patient needs in a day before switching to a long acting. You always wanna start low and go slow. We do this with most other chronic diseases. Start with the lowest effective dose and titrate up as needed. Long-term opioid use often begins with the treatment of acute pain. So make sure that you're appropriately addressing what is causing that acute pain issue. When opioids are used for acute pain, go low, start slow, use immediate release, and for no greater quality than needed for the expected duration of pain, severe enough to require opioids. Three days or less will often be sufficient and more than seven days will rarely be needed. And we'll walk through the Tennessee Together Act and some general guidelines on subsequent slides. When looking at the CDC guidelines, you can see that the risk or the hazard ratio goes up as the morphine milligram equivalents increase. So in general, when you get up above 50, you start to see an exponential rise in the risk or the hazard ratio. And when you get up over 100, that's where we see a lot of our unintentional overdoses happening. When it comes to opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, and discontinuation, there are also some guidelines to help. You wanna evaluate the benefits and harms with patients within one to four weeks of starting an opioid for chronic pain, or if you've changed the dose, specifically if you've escalated that dose. You should always evaluate the benefits and harms of continued therapy with patients every three months, or even more frequently if you're having continuous dosage ad adjustments. If your patient isn't receiving benefit or they haven't seen a 30% increase in function and pain, a decrease of 10% per month is a reasonable starting point to start tapering a patient off of an opioid product. A de decrease of 10 per week may work for some patients who have taken opioids for a shorter time, weeks to months, but if they've been on it for a year, 10% is probably where you wanna start. You also want to discuss the increased risk of overdose if patients quickly return to a previously prescribed higher dose. So remember, it takes a long time for that tolerance to form, but it goes away relatively quickly upon discontinuation. We're constantly evaluating risk factors for opioid related harms, and there are some strategies that you can incorporate to help mitigate that risk. If you're a prescriber, you could offer naloxone when factors increase risk for opioid overdose. If you're a pharmacist, you can dispense this with the collaborative pharmacy practice agreement. And if you have a patient that has a history of a previous overdose or a substance use disorder, or if they're on more than that 50 morphine milligram equivalents where we saw the hazard ratio start to increase, that might be a good time to have that conversation and make sure that they have Narcan or Naloxone available should they find themselves in a position where they've taken too much and are starting to experience that opioid-induced respiratory depression. 
Also, if benzodiazepines are concurrently prescribed, and ideally you wouldn't be on both, but if you are or you have a patient that's concurrently prescribed opioids and benzodiazepines, that combination increases the risk of an opioid-induced respiratory depression and overdose by about tenfold. You always want to review the patient's history in the controlled substance monitoring database to keep an eye on how they're feeling and what other controlled substances they might be on. This is vitally important to help identify a potential opioid use disorder in the making and really protect your patients from receiving multiple central nervous system depressants that might compound their risk for experiencing an overdose. There are several tools that you can do to test for this. You can use urine drug testing before starting opioid therapy and also consider urine drug testing at least annually to assess for prescribed medications, as well as other controlled prescription drugs and illicit drugs. You might think it's kind of counterintuitive, but if they're on a very high morphine milligram equivalent, you wanna test them and make sure that opioids are in their urine, because if they're not, that could be a sign of diversion and possible misuse. Avoid prescribing opioid pain medications and benzos concurrently. I've mentioned this already. And remember, that combination increases overdose risk by approximately tenfold, depending on the dose and the frequency of the combined use of those medications. Offer or arrange evidence-based treatment, usually medication-assisted treatment with buprenorphine or methadone in combination with behavioral therapies for patients who exhibit or are currently suffering from an opioid use disorder. When considering long-term opioid therapy, it, it's a good idea to kind of have these things in mind or keep this checklist with you. Remember, you want to set realistic goals for pain. A pain score of zero is not realistic. You want to make sure that you're improving function, reducing pain, but a pain score of zero is really indicative of over medication, being overly medicated and not necessarily a target for pain control. Check that non-opioid therapies have been tried and optimized before starting an opioid treatment. You want to maximize the coverage of you know, physical therapy, the use of NSAIDs, Tylenol, other type medications, maybe even try a muscle relaxer before you go to opioid treatments. Discuss the benefits and risks. For example, the risk of physical dependence and addiction, the risk of overdose, and what that means to the patient. Evaluate risks of harm or misuse, and check, always, always try to check the prescription drug monitoring program and there's some legal requirements and we'll discuss those a little bit later. You can also use urine drug screens to test for the drugs you're prescribing in your patients and those illicit or things that might not be on the PDMP or controlled substance monitoring database or in their verbally reported history to you. Set criteria for stopping or continuing opioids. Remember in general, the CDC recommends that patients should be seeing at least a 30% 30 improvement. And if they're not, it might be time to evaluate other treatment modalities and potentially taper them off of opioids. Schedule that initial reassessment within one to four weeks. Don't let it get too far out. And prescribe short acting opioids using the lowest dosage on product labeling first. And then once you've established what their daily cumulative morphine milligram requ equivalent requirement is, then you can consider using a twice daily longer acting medication to reduce that pill burden and boost that uh, peg scale. When reassessing at return visits, you wanna assess pain and function using the peg scale and compare results to the baseline to be able to gauge if you're making traction and heading towards that 30, percent increase in uh, quality of life and general function. Always evaluate risk of harms or misuse. You're always going to want to follow up and check the controlled substance monitoring database. You want to check that non-opioid therapies are continuing to be optimized and determine whether to continue, adjust, taper, or stop those opioids. 
Remember that the hazard ratio goes up on morphine milligram equivalents greater than 50, but remember also that opioids don't have a ceiling effect and because of tolerance, you'll have to continuously increase the dose if they're going to be treated long term. So just because they're on above 50 morphine milligram equivalents doesn't mean that they need to be tapered or need to be stopped. It's just you need to watch those patients because that hazard ratio goes up. Avoid starting people on more than 50 or 90. That should be a dose that people get to with longer term treatment and it shouldn't be an initiation dose. So avoid 90 or more morphine milligram equivalent totals per day. And there's some general guidelines there. So that's 90 milligrams of hydrocodone, 60 milligrams of oxycodone. And be careful when adjusting these because you might have a patient that is new to you that's been on 90 or more. So don't just start tapering them off immediately because remember, these patients may be, if not misusing, they're definitely physically dependent on these drugs and stopping them too quickly or too soon could push them to those illicit products like heroin on the street. Treatment options for chronic pain generally fall into six rough major categories. That's pharmacologic, physical medicine, behavioral medicine, neuromodulation, interventional therapies, and surgical approaches. And we'll talk about each one of these. Optimal patient outcomes often result from multiple approaches. So that might be physical medicine combined with behavioral medicine or any variation thereof. And medication should not be the sole focus of treatment, but should be used when needed in conjunction with other treatment modalities to meet treatment goals. So we've kind of found ourselves in this opioid epidemic or crisis by automatically turning to opioids to block those pain sensations when other non-narcotic therapies may have been equally as effective. Outside of what we usually think of as non-narcotic, Tylenol, NSAIDs like ibuprofen and the like, there's some other complementary and integrative health solutions that could also benefit your patients that you may want to discuss with them. Things like yoga, Tai Chi, meditation and mindfulness-based stress reduction, acupuncture, massage and manipulative therapies. All of these have been found to show some degree of benefit with acupuncture having the most clinical uh, science behind it, but all of these may be beneficial for your patients and it might be worth discussing with them. Other treatment modalities that are non-narcotic that have shown benefit to people suffering from chronic pain include physical therapy. The nice thing about physical therapy is it's being covered by third party payers and commercial insurance more now than ever as we're looking for efficacious solutions outside of the opioid realm. Exercise, weight reduction, counseling, and even smoking cessation. When looking at physical therapy specifically, you typically want to use passive modalities used in moderation. So you don't want to overdo it, just like you wouldn't want to overdo any medication or exercise. It typically involves stretching, strengthening, and conditioning. And that third bullet point there is really important. You're really emphasizing functional outcomes over pain reduction. So you want to make it so they can enjoy the things that they used to enjoy and be able to physically participate and the main fo focus or goal there is the functional outcomes, not necessarily an overall reduction in the pain. The goal should be to make the patient independent in maintenance exercise programs where they don't need to see a physical therapist all of the time. The physical therapist is there to help jumpstart their treatment, but ideally they would be able to ambulate and do these type exercises on their own. Weight reduction can play a huge role in musculoskeletal related pain syndromes. If a BMI is over 25, there's an increased incidence of osteoarthritis, increased risk of low back pain and other joint related injuries. And gaining 10 pounds of body weight can feel like 30 pounds of weight on your knees. And when walking or climbing upstairs, that 30 pounds feels more like 70 pounds to your knee joints. So, a weight reduction of about 10 pounds can relieve a lot of that joint associated stress and pain. 
A really good psychological history is really important and motivational interviewing and counseling skills can really help you elicit this information from your patients. You really need a past history of trauma or abuse, including adverse childhood experiences and anything that might be causing an underlying depression because it's known that depression changes how pain is perceived and in most cases makes the reporting of pain higher on a pain scale than it would be without a concurrent depressive episode or condition. You want to discuss coping styles. You want to be really sure that your patient understands the pain scale and scores and those descriptors that go along with it. Be realistic with your goals. If someone's at a six or a seven, a realistic goal might be a three or a four, not a one or a zero. Address any pending litigation, justice involvement, or other things that might be causing stress and changing the way people perceive pain. And those comorbid or depressive and anxiety type issues, those need to be treated along with, or maybe even before, really accurately addressing their current pain score and how you're gonna go forward and move forward with pain treatment. Try to assess your patient's willingness to stop or cut back on smoking. We know the adverse health effects that smoking can cause, but sometimes we don't know how that contributes to pain. People who smoke report higher rates of pain, higher intensity of pain. They have an increased incidence of disc or degenerative disc disease in the back, higher rates of osteoporosis and degenerative joint diseases. They have more social and occupational impairment. And that's partly by or because there are very few places or workplaces where you can smoke without having to remove yourself from that social environment or go outside or to a designated smoking area. And in general, persons who smoke have a reduced overall tolerance for pain. When looking at non-opioid therapies, NSAIDs and acetaminophen have a lot of evidence and for musculoskeletal or bone and joint pain, NSAIDs are in some cases superior to opioids because they actually treat the inflammation and swelling that is causing some of that pain in addition to their analgesic properties. You can use opioids obviously, but we know that there are risks associated with using opioid pharmaceuticals. You can use neuromodulation and several adjunctive therapies, muscle relaxants, antidepressants, and topical medications. And we'll discuss a few of those. So acetaminophen is typically re recommended as a first line treatment for pain. We're familiar with it. It's generally safe. It's over the counter. You need to make sure that when you are assessing pain, you get a complete over the counter history for your patients. So you know what they've tried already or might be using already. It's less effective than non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs and has the potential for liver toxicity at doses of greater than four grams per day. On OTC labeling, that's down to three grams per day because there's multiple products that our patients could take that is, contain acetaminophen and we wanna keep them on the low side of that spectrum before they ap approach that four grams. NSAIDs are effective for mild to moderate pain, a pain score of two to five, and really ideal for that musculoskeletal type pain. They have several risk factors depending on primarily age associated, but they also inhibit platelet aggregation. They can cause gastrointestinal insult, not directly, but by lessening or weakening those mucosal linings in the stomach. They don't cause you to bleed, they just make it easier to bleed in those areas. Also renal insult, so depending on how your kidneys are functioning, and adverse cardiovascular effects, and these are more uh, linked to the COX-2 inhibitors than NSAIDs alone. Those COX-2 inhibitors down there below, that's an option for patients who require chronic NSAID therapy and treatment who are at risk for those ulcers and, and uh, gastrointestinal bleeds. There's also topical medications. So capsaicin is an alkaloid, alkaloid derived from chili peppers. It's what we call a counter irritant. So it causes a burning sensation and basically tires out or wears out those nerve pathways that are sending those pain signals back to make 
the perception of that pain lessen. Topical NSAIDs show better results for acute pain than topical counter irritants and we have a really great over-the-counter drug now that used to be prescription and that's the Voltaren gel. Antidepressants like duloxetine and SNRI is effective for both chronic back and osteoarthritis pain and can also address those depressions that your patients might be experiencing. So this is an ideal drug for a patient that you may have that's suffering from both depression and a pain syndrome. Antispasmodics like psychobenzoprine, baclofen, and methocarbamol or muscle relaxers can help reduce the muscle twitching that might be exacerbating an acute pain syndrome or even a chronic pain syndrome. Taking a closer look at some of the topical agents that we have, we have the capsaicin, that counter irritant. It comes as a cream. It has poor efficacy for release of chronic musculoskeletal and neuropathic pain, but it might be useful as an adjunctive therapy for patients that aren't responding to other treatments. It takes a relatively long time for this to work. It needs to be applied three or four times per day over the entire painful area for up to six to eight weeks before optimal pain relief can be achieved. I mentioned that we have a newer NSAID that's over the counter. That's the Voltaren gel or diclofenac. It provides modest relief for acute musculoskeletal pain and evidence of effectiveness for chronic low back pain and widespread musculoskeletal pain. And this is really good for maybe some older patients that can't tolerate oral NSAIDs and really need something at the point of the pain. So really great for that osteoarthritis and those type pains. If non-opioid treatments and modalities have been tried and the patient's goals for pain relief and improvement in function aren't being met, it might be time to try opioid therapy. Remember, opioid naive patients should first be started on immediate release opioids as initial therapy. When starting opioids, avoid those compounds that might be compounded with other type drugs like acetaminophen or NSAIDs. Titrating dosing is difficult because of the risk of toxicity associated with the non-opioid component. Recall that hydrocodone was once a Schedule 3, and now it's a Schedule 2. It was a Schedule 3 compounded with acetaminophen with the thought that that acetaminophen portion would deter misuse, misuse and abuse because of the hepatic toxicity that can be involved with this, too much acetaminophen. But as we know now, that wasn't a deterrent at all and probably actually exacerbated those liver disease and issues with people that were opioid misusers or had opioid use disorder. Switching from an immediate release to an extended release opioid should be reserved for severe continuous pain and should only be started in patients who have been taking opioids for at least one week. Medications can be converted in a one-to-one -one ratio with the extended or long acting doses divided typically twice daily. So for example, if a patient uses 30 milligrams total of morphine immediate release in a day, they can be converted to 15 milligrams of morphine extended release twice daily. And typically there would be a small amount of immediate release tablets prescribed for breakthrough pain episodes. Another treatment is tramadol. It's a mixed mechanism opioid with a weak affinity for the mu opioid receptor and also serotonin and norepinephrine retake, reuptake inhibition. This is a second line agent for patients with fibromyalgia who haven't responded very well to initial therapy with other agents. Efficacy of tramadol for other types of chronic pain, including neuropathic pain, is relatively unclear. Combination of tramadol with other serotonin reuptake inhibitors can increase the risk for serotonin syndrome and toxicity and lead to seizures. So keep that in mind. Muscle relaxants can also be a treatment option for chronic pain and the relaxants cause the muscles to become less tense, lower the stiffness of the muscles and relieve the discomfort and pain via CNS depressive effects rather than analgesic effects. Skeletal muscle relaxants are indicated for short-term use, therefore multiple modalities, physical therapy, adjunctive analgesics, Tylenol, NSAIDs, may be warranted to prevent chronic use of these med medications. They can be used as an alternative to NSAIDs in patients who are at risk of gastrointestinal 
intestinal or renal complications. Those might be our elderly type patients. High incidence of dizziness and drowsiness and dry mouth with these drugs. And the risk of these agents increases with age and should be used with caution in older adults. And they're included on the Beers criteria list. Sedation typically tends to subside with chronic use, but remember, these are designed for short-term use, so should be used just for short-term periods if possible. And they're a second line adjunctive treatment only, so this shouldn't be your primary go-to pain treatment. Looking more specifically at some of the muscle relaxers that are available, we have cyclobenzaprine, typically dosed at 10 milligrams three times a day, there's also methocarbamol. This is 1,500 milligrams, dosed four times a day. And then there's baclofen, typically dosed three times a day, but it's also available as an intrathecal injection or for use in an intrathecal pump. The latter form is reserved for cases of severe spasticity. There's also tizanidine, two to four milligrams every six to 12 hours is needed. This should be administered with food and the capsule is approximately 80% of that of the tablet. So increases the plasma concentration of the tablet by 30%. There are also several other non-opioid treatment modalities, including epidural steroid injections that deliver anti-inflammatory medication directly into the epidural space. This eliminates the inflammatory compounds that mediate nervous tissue irritation in the epidural space and provide pain relief. ESIs are one of the most common procedures in pain management and can provide significant pain relief as part of a pain management plan. There's also cryoneuroblation. It's a specialized interventional pain management technique that uses cryoprobes to freeze sensory nerves at the source of pain and provide long-term pain relief. There's also intrathecal medication pumps, as mentioned with baclofen, there are also opioid receptors on the spinal cord and at specific areas of the brain, so significantly smaller doses of opioids in the spinal fluid can provide significant analgesia at much lower doses than can be achieved with oral opioids. There's also regenerative adult autologous stem cell therapy. This is a relatively newer treatment modality, but it does show promise in the treatment of multiple painful conditions. Transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation can also be used to treat pain if this involves the application of electrical currents directly to the skin. It delivers a low voltage electrical current from a small battery operated device to the skin via surface electrodes. It's a safe, non-invasive, FDA approved treatment that can be self-applied. Conventional TENS produces para-anesthesia in the area under the electrodes and the production of muscle twitches is desirable with acupuncture light -like tens. Another form of neuromodulation involves, involves spinal cord stimulation, a spinal neuromodulation analgesic system, and this is an option for chronic neuropathic pain, which can arise after nerve or nervous system injury. This is surgical implantation of a spinal cord stimulator that when turned on, delivers mild electrical pulses to nerve fibers in the spinal cord. The electricity interrupts the pain signals that are carried to the brain, providing relief to the patients. When treating chronic pain, it's important to remember that not all patients are the same and not all treatment modalities will be effective for every patient. So when treating someone for chronic pain, make sure that you pull out all the tools in your toolbox, starting with those non-pharmacologic, specifically non-opioid options. So pull out everything in your pain management toolbox. And you can see here from patient A to patient D, the results and what was needed vary from patient to patient over on the right side. NSAIDs, yoga, and nerve blocks may work for one patient, while acupuncture, trigger point injections, and self-management works better for another. But we wanna maximize non-opioid therapies before ever considering or initiating opioid treatment because of the associated risks of physical dependent and subsequent addiction, and ultimately forming an opioid use disorder that may lead to an opioid overdose. 
In an effort to directly combat the ongoing opioid epidemic, legislation was introduced in the form of the Tennessee Together Act and was signed by Governor Haslam in my hometown of Maryville in Blunt County at Blunt Memorial Hospital. Tennessee Together is a multifaceted plan designed to combat the opioid epidemic in three different ways. Number one, prevention. Prevent opioid addiction and ultimately misuse and abuse by limiting the supply and dosage of initial opioid prescription to three days at a dosage of no more than 180 morphine milligram equivalents. So this is designed to prevent the next generation from falling into the trap of physical dependence and subsequent misuse and abuse. Also, we know that we have a lot of Tennesseans that are suffering from an opioid use disorder. So there's money for treatment, along with a proposed research-based increase investment in the 2018-19 budget of more than $25 million for treatment and recovery services for individuals with opioid use disorder. Then there's law enforcement. This increases state funding to attack the illicit sale and trafficking of opioids and is really designed to align what the federal government knows versus the state government versus our local drug enforcement agencies. So they all work together in tandem to help prevent these opioids from coming into our state. In Tennessee specifically, we have two major highways, I-75 going north to south and I-40 going east to west that crisscrosses our state. So opioids come in and out relatively easily. Tennessee Together seeks to mandate the use of the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database, and there's certain times when a prescriber or dispenser has to do this. So before prescribing an opioid or benzodiazepine at the beginning of a new episode of treatment, that means the drug has not been prescribed within the previous six months, the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database needs to be checked before initiating so you know, is my patient already on an opioid? Are they on a benzodiazepine? Have they been on them in the past? It just gives you a clearer picture of their past controlled substance use. You also need to check prior to the issuance of each new prescription for the controlled substance for the first 90 days of a new treatment episode. So for the first 90 days, for each 30-day prescription, you need to be checking the controlled substance monitoring database. After that 90-day period, if they need to be on opioids long-term, it now translates into a chronic condition and you don't need to check as frequently. If that's the case, you need to check at least every six months when that controlled substance remains part of the patient's treatment plan. And remember, prescribers and dispensers have a professional responsibility to check the database for any controlled substance if doctor shopping, diversion, or other misuse is suspected. So if your gut tells you to check, check. The initial legislative changes went in, into effect April 9th, 2019, and they include those CSMD checks under certain circumstances, the inclusion of ICD-10 codes, there originally was a partial fill requirement, meaning they couldn't get the full fill on a new prescription. They could only get a partial fill, and then if they needed the rest, they could come back. That's been removed. There's a three-day or cough exemption, meaning if it's used to treat cough, like codeine products and those, they can be dispensed for up to 14 days. There are some uh, morphine milligram equivalent day supply limits. There's a general limit of up to 500. The surgery limit has been removed. And then there's a me medical necessity limit, up to 30 days and 1,200 morphine milligram equivalents. And then there's some exempt prescriptions. And we'll talk about what that means on the next slide. So what do, exactly does it mean to be exempt? The following individuals and their prescriptions for an opioid pain treatment are exempt if the prescription includes the ICD-10 code and the word exempt if they fall into one of these categories. Patients receiving active or palliative care cancer treatment, patients receiving hospice care, patients with a diagnosis of sickle cell disease, patients receiving opioid in a licensed facility, so this would be a hospital type setting patient seeing a pain management specialist. 
a patient treated with an opioid for 90 days or more in the last year who are subsequently treated for 90 days or more. So they've made it through that initial acute phase and now it's longer than 90 days and that's deemed chronic. Those being treated with methadone, buprenorphine, or now Trexone, common medications prescribed to treat opioid use disorder. In patients who have suffered severe burns or a major physical trauma, they're also exempt. What it means to be a licensed facility, these are examples. I mentioned hospitals. Those can be rehab centers, nursing homes, um, homes for the age, residential HIV supportive living facilities. So you can see some examples there. Also, patients seeing a pain management specialist. These are very specific and I wouldn't expect most dispensers or pharmacists to know whether or not a specific provider has met these qualifications or not. But in general, a board certified anesthesiologist is automatically termed or deemed a pain management specialist. Beyond that, there are some other requirements that need to be met to meet the qualification as a pain management specialist. This slide serves as a visual representation of how many tablets a patient could leave the pharmacy with depending on what kind of prescription they receive. So for example, if you look at hydrocodone and the five milligram tablets, before the Tennessee Together Act, patients could come in and receive roughly 240 tablets in the first initial fill. The idea behind the Tennessee Together Act is to limit initial exposure. So you can see there, 10 care has additional requirements that shouldn't exceed 40 morphine milligram equivalents. So that's eight tabs for an initial fill. Most other commercial insurers will cover a three day supply and that three day limit we'll talk about on the next slide. Three days or less, you don't need to check the controlled substance monitoring database. You've got the 10 day limit, that's 500 morphine milligram equivalents. A patient could walk out with 105 milligram tabs of hydrocodone. And then that maximum is the 1200 morphine milligram equivalents. This is for a patient that has a severe or exempt category. And remember, for someone who's on hospice or palliative care, that increasing dose goes up indefinitely. So it isn't uncommon to have one of those patients that's on 1200 or more morphine milligram equivalents. The surgery has been removed from the initial 2019 guidelines. So without that one, everything remains the same. So pulling all of this together, this slide really kind of drives home what's happening out there. So you've got green, yellow, and red. And you can look at this one of two ways. If you're in the green zone, you're doing everything right. If you're in the yellow zone, you need to kind of take a step back and evaluate your patient a little bit more closely. And if you're in the red zone, you're prescribing way too many opioids and you really need to slow down or stop. I look at this the exact opposite way. If you're in the green zone up to three days, you're likely not checking the controlled substance monitoring database because it's not required by law. So three days or less, you don't have to check. That's where doctor shopping lives. So that's when a patient can go to one hospital, let's say Blunt Memorial ER, the ER at UT, Fort Sanders, Methodist, and get the same prescription and then go shop that at four different pharmacies. And if no one checks the CSMD, then they can get four prescriptions filled for the same opioid at four different pharmacies from four different providers. So, if you're going to write an opioid or controlled substance in general, please check the controlled substance monitoring database. If you get into that yellow zone, checking the CSMD is required by law. You should also be conducting a thorough evaluation of the patient, which I would assume every practitioner is doing anyways. You need to document that alternate therapies or non-opioid therapies were considered and or tried before the opioid was written. You need to obtain informed consent. So you need to have the discussion about the potential risks of opioid therapy. And if it's a woman of childbearing age, 
you need to talk about the risks of neonatal abstinence syndrome and an unborn infant being born dependent to opioids if those are prescribed during a pregnancy. You also need to include the ICD-10 code in the patient's chart and on the prescription. So that's the yellow zone. When you get to the red zone, I look at that as you've done all the right things, you've done everything in the yellow zone, and an opioid is the right medication for this patient at this time. So you've done your due diligence, it's gonna turn into a chronic pain syndrome, and opioids are just the treatment of choice. So I look at this completely opposite, with red meaning you can kind of relax a little bit because you've worked with your patient, you developed that relationship, you've done everything in that white box, and opioids are the right drug. That yellow zone, it can go either way, but that's where you're doing your due diligence. And the green zone, if you're not checking and you're just pumping out opioid prescriptions in a three-day quantity, you are going to be doctor shopped, and you need to be very, very careful in those situations. Looking at this another way, uh, just kind of walks you through this treatment algorithm. Um, the DEA rules now align with state and federal laws for partially filled controlled substances, and those aren't required anymore. And really the big thing on this slide is e-prescribing. This year, all C2s have to be e-prescribed directly from the provider to the pharmacy of choice. So remember, those e-prescriptions it was a long time coming, but on the pharmacy side and from a pharmacist, this makes our job so much easier because now we don't have to be so critical on those handwritten prescriptions and having to determine, is this legitimate or not? Is this a prescription pad that was stolen? And this is a, a fake prescription. So when they're electronically prescribed directly from the healthcare facility to the pharmacy, that eliminates that one barrier to appropriate care for our patients that might be needing opioid therapy. So which of the following patients is not exempt to applying opioid prescribing laws or regulations? Is it a patient treated with methadone? Is it a patient receiving palliative cancer treatment? Is it a patient receiving care in a halfway house? Or a patient treated by a pain management specialist? So in this instance, it's C. So if you didn't pay careful attention to the list of exempt facilities, a halfway house is not included on that list. All of the other options, A, B, and D, are exempt from applying opioid prescribing laws and regulations. So taking a closer look at the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database, that's what we typically call it here in the state of Tennessee. You might also hear it referred to as the PDMP, or Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, but regardless of what it's called, they all do the same thing. And let's talk about exactly what that is. Tennessee's Controlled Substance Monitoring Database and most CSMDs do three things. Patient tracking of records, also prescriber tracking of records, and serves to surveil, monitor, and as an informational repository for research. So this helps track dispensing records and patterns and also prescribing records and patterns. Tennessee's CSMD committee includes one governor appointed and licensed member of each of the following healthcare professional licensure boards or committees. One member of the Board of Pharmacy and one member of the Board of Medical Examiners who are appointed to those boards to represent the general public are also included. So Pharmacy and the Board of Medical Examiners technically have two representatives on the governor appointed board. Currently, the Tennessee Department of Health has data sharing agreements with the following states. So that means you can pull data from other CSMDs if that's relevant. So for example, if I'm checking a prescription and I don't have any red flags or reasons to think that anything is going on, I'm not gonna check Arizona and Arkansas. Now, if it's a snowbird that typically lives in Florida and they're passing through on their way to Ohio, I'm probably going to pull the Florida record and the Ohio record to look for controlled substance dispensing in those two states. 
but in general, you won't need to check contingent or other states in most cases. Who must be registered in the CSMD? That's going to be all healthcare practitioners with a DEA number who prescribe or dispense a controlled substance in a practice providing direct care to patients in the state of Tennessee on more than 15 days in a calendar year. So that's basically going to be almost all providers and every pharmacist that dispenses a controlled substance. Licensed veterinarians who never prescribe or dispense a controlled substance in amount intended to treat a non-human patient for more than five days, they're not required to, but they are encouraged to register. Who can register? That's any person licensed, registered, or otherwise permitted to prescribe, distribute, or dispense a controlled substance in the course of professional practice. Practitioners can also have delegates that can register with the permission of a supervision of the practitioner. Such individuals can include any person authorized to practice pursuant to Title 63 and up to two other persons per healthcare provider. So that up to two other persons is really important. This can be a front desk receptionist. This can be another non-clinical person that can possibly pull these records and have those available for the prescriber to help speed up that workflow process. When must someone register who is required to register? This is gonna be within 30 days of initial registration with the DEA for prescribing healthcare practitioners or licensure for dispensers. So that's gonna be 30 days of receiving that DEA number for providers, and then immediately upon receiving your license for pharmacists. What is needed to register? If you live in the state of Tennessee and you have a valid Tennessee driver's license, that's all that's needed. If you don't have a Tennessee driver's license, it's not that you can't register, you'll just have to call someone on the CSMD staff and register via telephone. But if you've got a Tennessee driver's license, that's all that's needed. Also, if you have a delegate or you have an extender that's gonna be checking the CSMD on your behalf, what they need to do is you need to provide them with your driver's license number and then they register that and that links them to you as a supervisor for their access to the CSMD. This might be trivial, but if you work in a hospital setting or a large clinic and you're working with patients and you don't physically pull the CSMD reports yourself and someone else does that, make sure that they're registered as one of your extenders by giving them their, your driver's license number so that they can be linked to you. In which of the following scenarios is checking the CSMD not required? You suspect the patient is doctor shopping, hopping from ER to ER and going from pharmacy to pharmacy. The prescription contains all required documentation and is for a 30-day supply of oxycodone following hip surgery. The prescription is written for a three-day supply of hydrocodone at less than 180 morphine milligram equivalents, but does not contain an ICD-10 code. The prescription is written for oxycodone, alprazolam, and carisoprodol. So in this situation, the one that's not required would be C. Remember, if a prescription is written for three days or less at less than 180 morphine milligram equivalents, there's no need to check the CSMD and there's no requirement to include an ICD-10 code. If you suspect the patient is doctor shopping, you should absolutely check the CSMD. In B, that's an acute pain syndrome, potentially for an opioid naive patient, and you wouldn't wanna provide them with a 30-day supply. You'd wanna limit their exposure to opioids. And D, that is known as the holy trinity. That is an opioid, a benzodiazepine, and a muscle relaxer. Medically, you can have any combination of two of these drugs, but there's no medical necessity to have all three. And this combination greatly exacerbates the risk for an opioid-induced respiratory depression. So this is a DEA red flag, 
and most pharmacists won't dispense this and physicians should not be writing all three of these concurrently. Who is required to check the CSMD? We know some circumstances when you should, but this is going to be practitioners prescribing an opioid or a benzodiazepine to a patient as a new episode of treatment. And every six months thereafter, when that controlled substance remains a part of their treatment. A new episode's meaning that controlled substance has not been prescribed by that healthcare practitioner within the previous six months. So that's important. It hasn't been prescribed by that healthcare practitioner. They may have been on it by another provider, but if you're a new provider, you need to check the CSMD. When is checking not required for an opioid or benzodiazepine? Some common, common instances are when this is prescribed or dispensed for a patient on hospice care. When the amount does not exceed a single three-day treatment period and does not allow a refill and is less than 180 morphine milligram equivalents in total. Or prescribed for administration directly to a patient during the course of an inpatient or residential treatment in a hospital or nursing home licensed under Title 68. So one of those facilities on the exempted list. As a pharmacist, I use the CSMD regularly and the results of increased CSMD utilization are clear. Doctor shopping declined 92% between 2012 and 2020. That is incredible. So that remaining 8%, that is typically seen in those prescriptions that are for three days or less that can still be doctor shopped if providers aren't checking the CSMD and prescribers and other providers aren't mandated to but at the pharmacy level, we should still be checking on those prescriptions. So even if the doctor isn't checking, pharmacies should check this before they're doctor shopped. So you can see there in the left side, the orange is a patient that goes and sees four doctors, fills the same prescription at four different pharmacies. So that remaining 8% of doctor shopping for opioids specifically resides in those three days or less prescriptions typically coming out of ERs and urgent care facilities. So let's take a look at the CSMD and what it looks like. In the upper left hand corner you'll see the website. I hope you're all familiar with this or at least have a link in your uh, computerized physician order entry system or your pharmacy software. When you log in, you simply click request or hover over request and select new request. The information needed to make a request or query of the CSMD is the patient's last name, their first name and date of birth. You'll also notice it defaults to 12 months and that's typically enough to check the CSMD. If you need more information, you can go back to, I think, 36 months and you can change the date filled from field and the date filled to field, but de by default, it defaults to 12 months. There's also a new box and that's right there kind of in the middle. Request is related to overdose. So I use this one quite frequently. I serve on the Overdose Fatality Review Board for Knox County. And to access the CSMD, it needs to be pursuant to a written prescription or medication request at the pharmacy side. So I've received a controlled prescription and I'm checking the CSMD. So without that box request is related to an overdose, if someone has passed away and they're not my patient and I don't have a prescription, legally I can't access their information in the CSMD. So this allows for research purposes and follow up on those decedents that have passed away directly related to some kind of drug overdose to get a better grasp on what might have happened and give access to the CSMD legally. Down below that, that is where you can request other states to query. And in the bottom right hand corner, once you've made all of your selections and entered the requested information, you simply click create. 
this is what's going to pop up. I've used myself as, a, as an example there. So it says Brian Winbigler. If there's different variations of the name, typically what you'll see is it will be Brian Winbigler and there'll be different addresses listed. In that situation, I simply collect, select all of the patients there and then click Submit. You'll see it come up like this. It'll say your request has been processed automatically. It will have the patient's information there and you'll see an attachment. It says patient RX history report PDF. Click on that and if you have a PDF reader that should open automatically. And this is what a standard report looks like. So you'll see the patient's name, their demographic information, and the box on the right side, you'll see a 285. This is the active cumulative morphine equivalent. This is just a guide. Remember above 50 morphine equivalents, that's when the hazard ratio increases. And then above 100, a lot of fatal overdoses occur uh, above 100 morphine milligram equivalents, but these are just guidelines to let you know how many active cumulative morphine mil milligram equivalents your patient has in their possession. Below that, it lists the fill date by date in sequential order. It lists the drug, the quantity, the day supply, who prescribed that drug, when that drug was written, the morphine milligram equivalent daily dose, whether it's active or not, yes or no. And it also lists the pharmacy that dispensed it and how the patient paid for that drug on the far right side. So there's a lot of information here. The prescribers for prescriptions listed are listed there. It will list the doctor's name and address and any relevant credentials. And then below that, it will list the pharmacies that dispensed the prescriptions listed and their uh, address and contact information. The next page shows some calculations that are used to calculate the morphine equiv equivalents. Uh, this is for your reference because it's automatically calculated. And on the next slide, it will do the math for you. So this is where it's taken what the patient has in their possession and has done the calculations to come up with the active cumulative morphine equivalent. Now you'll see under the patient's name, John Doe, the red R. So what that means is they're on greater than 120 active cumulative morphine equivalents per day. Remember, red is typically bad. This is just an indicator that you should take a closer look at this patient and for these patients, this would be a good idea to have that conversation about dispensing or having the physician co-prescribe Narcan or a naloxone product to help prevent an opioid-induced respiratory depression and revive someone who may experience an unintended overdose related to opioid use. So diving into the 2021 annual report for the CSMD, the morphine milligram equivalent prescribed and dispensed to patients in Tennessee has decreased by almost 57%. This is great. The Tennessee Together Act was designed to limit initial exposure to opioid naive patients. So seeing this decline is very promising. The MME prescribed by the top 50 prescribers has decreased 57%. The number of potential doctor shoppers has decreased 92% and we've discussed that and that is fabulous. The number of opioid prescriptions for pain has decreased by 43% and cases of neonatal abstinence syndrome have decreased by 26%. And that's when children or infants are born physically dependent on a substance that their mother was using in utero while they were in utero. Searches of the CSMD have increased 684% since 2012 to 2020 and continue to increase. This is because 
we're seeing the utility of the CSMD on the pharmacy level. This is one of my favorite tools to help protect my patients. And at the prescriber level, this is a great way to not only track your own prescribing history, but really to keep an eye on your patients and make sure they're not falling into any of the traps or pitfalls that would be indicative of developing a substance use disorder. The number of CSMD requests has increased 11% in 2020 alone to 14,611,465 compared with 2019. So we're continuing to see double digit increases in use. And there was one search of the CSMD for every 1.1 prescriptions in Tennessee in 2020. So that's great, which was up from one search for every 10 in 2012. So the CSMD is working, it's a great tool, and I encourage all of you guys to utilize it if you can. Distribution of the top 10 most frequently prescribed controlled substances in 2020. Hydrocodone is back up at the top. It had dropped down and I think oxycodone was the preferred for a little while, now it's back to hydrocodone. You see gabapentin creeping up on the list. It's now number two. It was farther down the list. We're seeing more misuse of super therapeutic doses of gabapentin. And as we transition away from opioids, gabapentin has found its role in treating more neuropathic type uh, pain disorders. Then you have oxycodone, benzodiazepine, alprazolam, buprenorphine. We're seeing this increase, which is promising because as we transition away from opioids and are treating opioid use disorder, we would like to see buprenorphine use tick up. We see an increased use in amphetamines. Remember, that's indicative of the potential amphetamine epidemic that's going to follow the opioid epidemic. You see zolpidem and other sleeping medications, tramadol is on the list, clonazepam, and then phentermine, so another stimulant type drug. Looking at this another way, opioid for pain, we know that those prescriptions have decreased and they continue to decline. Buprenorphine is increasing, but not as uh, quick a, a rate as the opioid for pains are declining. And we know we have a lot of physically dependent people and a lot of people suffering from opioid use disorder. So that buprenorphine for OUD should be going up at a higher rate. Benzodiazepines are going down. That uh, is right in line with the opioids for pain because remember, if you're dispensing an opioid or a benzodiazepine, you should be checking the CSM, CSMD as mandated by law. Muscle relaxants are kind of going down on the list. Stimulants are going up, and we've talked a little bit about that. Those sleeping drugs are going down. There's an other category that kind of encompasses all aggregate controlled substances that don't fall into one of these buckets. And then gabapentin, um, it hasn't been a controlled substance until 2018. So that's why you don't see data before that, but you can see that its use is increasing. So the CSMD does have some limitations and its main limitation is the accuracy of the data contained. So it's just like anything else, you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. So if you're putting in inaccurate information or garbage in, you get garbage out. So a good gold standard of practice is to enter information on a patient or a new patient into the CSMD using a government issued photo ID or a government issued ID card of some sort. That helps standardize what's entered into the system. So the most common thing that we see is patient names being misspelled or entered incorrectly. Also varying addresses. If you're using that driver's license, that's most likely gonna be the most current address that they have on file. Date of birth being entered incorrectly. NDC codes are not included. So remember, you the ICD-10 codes might be required on some C2 prescriptions, but that data isn't carried into the CSMD and neither are those NDC codes for the drugs that are dispensed. Prescribers and patients. So prescribers can check their own dispensing or prescribing history and that 
record isn't entered until the patient's prescription is filled at the pharmacy. So for prescribers, you might write a prescription and then it never shows up on the CSMD. And what that means is your patient never filled that prescription. So not, not only is the CSMD a tool to track what your patients are doing, it's also a tool to track what they're not doing. Um, inaccurate pharmacists and techs. So entering information on the prescribers incorrectly or entering incorrect information on the pharmacy or pharmacist that dispense that medication. So basically just data entry errors. What's not in there? I mentioned the ICD-10 codes and also federal data. So VA medical centers, some of those are added now, but if it's a federally run methadone or buprenorphine clinic, that information is not included. And that would be very helpful to know if you're dispensing an opioid product to a patient, if they're in a treatment program and they're receiving methadone or buprenorphine. Also, any verbal or annotated instructions or communications aren't included in the CSMD filing. There is legislation to include federally run methadone and buprenorphine clinics in the CSMD, but to my knowledge that hasn't passed through yet and I haven't seen that information included, but I don't see other than the states and feds not always working really well together, uh, I would like to see that information included just as a patient safety factor. Here's that same example report that I showed you earlier, and I'm gonna walk you through how I utilize this report in my daily duties at the pharmacy. So for this particular prescription, I received a Percocet prescription, so I pulled the CSMD report, and the first thing that I'm gonna do, Percocet's a C2, it should be filled 30 out of 30 days, so I'm gonna look at the fill history and see if this prescription is due to be filled today. So I've highlighted all the Percocet prescriptions and you can see them here. And then the next thing that I do is I look to see if they've been filled at appropriate times. So 30 out of 30 days. And this is what I see. So I'm not the pharmacist in charge and this isn't my normal pharmacy I'm filling in at this store today. So I don't know the patients and I don't know the situations. But when I look down and I see that 27, there's a note in the system that says this was an early fill due to a vacation and it was a cruise where the patient wouldn't be able to fill their prescription. So it was filled three days early. Okay, I can understand that. The next one, 29 days, that's an easy mistake. They got it three days early. We're gonna hold them three days later. And that third day, does it occur at 11.59? on the day before or does it occur at midnight the day after so basically at midnight is it the day before or the day after so i can see how it was filled one day early the 13 and 21 those are blatantly filled too early and really exposes the patient to too many morphine equivalents and gives them access to too much medication all at once so how did that happen well, in this situation, pharmacy number two happened. If you look over on the right side, this patient was filling consistently at one single pharmacy. So what may have happened in this example is they took a prescription to a new pharmacy. They weren't in that pharmacy system. They put in the patient's information. They took the prescription, saw there was no previous fills for an opioid and said, okay, there's nothing in there, we'll go ahead and fill this, and they didn't check the CSMD. So that's how this patient got it so early. That was filled at pharmacy two. The next one was filled at pharmacy one again, nine days early. How did that happen? Well, if you're familiar with the dispensing process and patients that are on chronic C2 therapy, they are picking up their prescriptions consistently on the 30th day, they're there when the doors open and they don't miss. So in this situation, what likely happened is they brought in their prescription, they pulled up the profile and noticed, oh gosh, you're late, this is absolutely due. And they didn't check the CSMD because they're used to this patient, they've been filling there a long time and they just didn't check it. So that's how they got it early again. So that's how this can happen in both of these instances 
could have been avoided had the pharmacy checked the CSMD. Looking at this same report and looking at another controlled prescription, the gabapentin, you can see that the exact same thing happened with the gabapentin, where they were consistently filling at pharmacy one and then filled at pharmacy two and got an early refill. So common safety concerns and drug interactions, we've mentioned this one throughout the presentation, but benzodiazepine prescribed in combination with opioids is a much greater danger of harm compared to either one taken in isolation. So benzodiazepines and opioids both depress respiration, thereby increasing the risk for potentially lethal respiratory depression. So there's a black box label on both opioids and benzodiazepines highlighting the dangers of concomitant prescribing. This is common in multiple prescriber situations where one prescriber may not know what the other one is doing and utilization of the CSMD is key to identifying potentially harmful combinations. So if you are gonna write for an opioid and or a benzodiazepine, you should always be checking the CSMD because even if you're not prescribing both, another provider may be prescribing an opioid where you're prescribing a benzo, the patient gets both of those. And ideally, the patient should be filling at one pharmacy so that they can be the central hub for all of the drugs that they're receiving and be able to screen for those interactions. But in the situation where they're using multiple pharmacies and multiple providers, a patient safety factor is all dispensers and prescribers checking the CSMD. And that's what's mandated under the Tennessee Together Act for writing and dispensing both opioids and benzodiazepines. It's not just opioids. There are other drugs that are concerning when used concomitantly with benzodiazepines, and those include many insomnia drugs. So the BZRAs, or non-benzodiazepine benzodiazepine receptor agonists, those increase risk for amnesia and blackouts. And that risk increases when used with benzodiazepines. So these Z drugs include Lunesta, Sonata, and Ambien. And this also includes any other CNS depressant, including alcohol. So there's a new black box warning on the Z drugs regarding sleepwalking and sleep driving, which basically says if you've experienced amnesia or blackouts while using any of the Z drugs, that is a contraindic contraindication to continuing to take that specific Z drug and any other drug in the class. So keep that in mind. But using any of these drugs, including alcohol with benzodiazepine, increases the risk for that overt CNS depression. Another interaction involves proton pump inhibitors. PPIs utilize the same metabolic pathway utilized by benzodiazepines for metabolism. So what that causes and is an increased risk for CNS depression, confusion, sedation, dizziness, and falls. And some common PPIs are Prilosec, Nexium, Prevacid, and Protonix. And many of those, while they used to be prescription only, are now over the counter. So it's really important that you do a, a very thorough medication history with your patients and include all over-the-counter products that they may be taking. You might want to dose adjust for PPI use or use lorazepam or oxazepam for patients on chronic PPIs because lorazepam and oxazepam aren't metabolized as extensively in the liver as the other benzodiazepines. There's also an interaction involving fluoroquinolone antibiotics, and those are typically used and frequently used to treat respiratory tract infections. And the problem here is the fluoroquinolone antibiotics compete for the same binding sites as benzodiazepines, blocking the benzodiazepines from binding. That can cause acute withdrawal for those who are physically dependent on those benzodiazepines, and that can include sleep disturbances, irritability, nausea, vomiting, headaches, seizures, a lot of physical manifestations of withdrawal. 
Shorter acting benzodiazepines produce a brief and more intense withdrawal reaction that usually begins within 24 hours of discontinuation. So you need to be cognizant of patients who are on chronic benzodiazepine therapy when being treated for an acute respiratory disorder or being treated with a fluoroquinolone antibiotic. Longer acting benzodiazepines have a slower development of withdrawal symptoms that typically peak at about seven days. So be sure that you counsel patients on this interaction and select an alternate antibiotic when possible. There are certain OTC herbal supplements, grapefruit, and other drugs that can potentiate the effects of benzodiazepines. Kava is one of those that's thought to modulate the same GABA receptors and create a synergistic effect leading to excessive CNS depression when used in conjunction with benzodiazepines. St. John, St. John's wort is a potent SIP inducer and it interacts with the whole host of medications. And in this instance, it decreases benzodiazepine effectiveness. Those cytochrome P450 SIP enzymes that metabolize drugs, in terms of benzodiazepines, they're rapidly absorbed highly protein bound, and most are hepatically metabolized by CYP3A4 and or CYP2C19. So there's a listing of which ones are metabolized by which CYP enzyme. And in general, drugs that are substrates or utilize the CYPs for metabolism prolong the half-life of benzodiazepines listed above. Drugs that induce or activate the P450 metabolic pathway reduce benzodiazepine effect and those that inhibit that metabolism pathway increase benzodiazepine effect. Looking more at safety, this is just a list for your reference of common P450 inducers, substrates and inhibitors. There is a uh, unique mnemonic that you can use to remember these, but Full disclosure, I just keep a list with me in the pharmacy so that I can very quickly identify those drugs that are going to interact with benzodiazepines. So when it comes to benzodiazepine tapering, this is typically easier said than done, but here are some general guidelines that are evidence-based. So if you're going to taper, consider switching to a long-acting benzodiazepine before you initiate the taper. So diazepam has a 20 to 100 hour half-life. So for this, a two milligram per milliliter solution allows small incremental reductions. Clonazepam, 18 to 50 hour half-life. So the dose size limits small incremental reductions. And then there's phenobarbital, not used as much as the other two above, but it has a half-life of 50 to 120 hours, and the dose size allows reasonable incremental reductions, but typically the easiest way is the two milligram per milliliter solution because that's more manageable for the patients. Physically easier said than done. This needs to be compounded typically by a pharmacist, and then performed by patients with online guidance or very detailed written instructions. Some suggested ways for tapering, there's daily micro tapering, and that's very small reductions every day for weeks to months. So ways to do that, you can do dry cutting with a razor blade. I recommend using a pill splitter over a razor blade. Pill splitters can be found at any pharmacy and they'll help you split those tabs reliably and more consistently. There's liquid water dissolution. That's where you would simply make a suspension, mixing in 100 milliliters of water. Then you would simply discard one milliliter and ingest 99. You would simply continue this process until you got down to the desired tapered dose. So the next reduction you would discard two milliliters and so on. For this, you've got to have some clinical skills. You've got to be patient with your dose splitting. You've got to be patient with how fast you're tapering. It's a collaborative effort between the physician and the patient and even the pharmacy. And motivational interviewing is very good to use here because typically what we'll see is we have patients that have been on benzodiazepines, which are really designed for short-term use, 
for weeks, months, and even years. So the longer a person's on a medication that is like a benzodiazepine or any scheduled drug, it's gonna be harder to get them to come off of that. So that's both physiologic with the withdrawal and psychologic because they think that they need it to function. So motivational interviewing and working with that patient and coming up with reasons as to why they may need to taper are gonna be very important in these scenarios and situations. There are other safety tools that have been around for years that now include updates that specifically address the concomitant use of opioids and benzodiazepines. The Beers Criteria list was last updated in 2019 and includes the recommendation to avoid the concurrent use of opioids with either benzodiazepines or gabapentinoids due to the increased risk of overdose and severe sedation related adverse events such as respiratory depression and death. There's also the screening tool of older person's prescriptions or the STOP. That includes considerations of drug-drug interactions and duplications of drugs within a class. So the beers and STOP criteria are both really clinically useful in most practical settings. There's also the screening tool to alert doctors to the right treatment or START. And these are interventions that require substantial effort by pharmacists or physicians. They're highly effective for de-prescribing inappropriate medications, but are challenging to implement in the real world due to time constraints, increased effort, and the cost required to make these successful interventions. I can't comment enough on how important communication is to coordinate care and keep patients safe and have their best safety and outcomes in mind. Care shared among multiple providers should be coordinated to the greatest extent possible, and those inherent professional hierarchies should not limit one provider's autonomy and sense of responsibility to make changes that are in the patient's best interest. Some common examples are a primary care physician versus a specialist, a nurse practitioner working with a physician, a pharmacist working with a prescriber. So when a pharmacist might be using the SMART criteria and recommending to de-prescribe a medication, that recommendation for de-prescribing de has to be clear, concise, include supporting evidence, and provide information on how to accomplish the de-prescribing recommendation. Here's an example of a simple form that can be used to communicate between pharmacists and physicians. And in the de-prescribed trial, it was found that both physicians and pharmacists endorsed the use of a standardized format for evidence-based pharmaceutical opinions that promote intraprofessional communication for de-prescribing inappropriate medications for their patients. Other safety concerns involve neonatal abstinence syndrome. And currently effective as of July 1st, 2018, Public Chapter 901 states that for a three-day opioid prescription, a physician must obtain informed consent from a woman of childbearing age defined as ages 15 to 44, capable of becoming pregnant to include risks of opioids, methods of birth control, and the availability of free or reduced cost birth control. So again, this is for any prescription of three days or more involving an opioid. This slide serves to demonstrate why we needed legislation to mandate that women of childbearing age be counseled on the risks associated with opioid use during pregnancy. We'd seen a steady increase in our NAS rate up until the end of 2017 when the legislation was enacted. We saw a very steady decline in our NAS rate until 2019 where it leveled off and now we've seen a slight uptick in 2020. But if you look down at the bottom, the reason we needed this legislation is almost 70% of the cases were from legally prescribed and dispensed opioid medications. This further demonstrates the need for prescribers to be very clear in counseling women of childbearing age on the risk of using opioids, where 50% of the cases, only substances prescribed to the mother contributed to that baby's neonatal abstinence syndrome. Let's explore some safety barriers. 
Clinical inertia, or keeping an inherited patient on a medication because they've always been on it, is relatively common. And one of the most common cases is where a physician has retired or passed away. Another provider inherits those patients and keeps them on the controlled substances that they're currently on because they've always been on them. Also, prescribing medication is viewed as being helpful and positive, and deprescribing or taking medications away is oftentimes viewed as being harmful or punitive. Another barrier is simply not identifying inappropriate medications and underutilization of some common tools like the beers, stop, start, and the CSMD. You also need to openly discuss expectations and not be afraid to do so. You need to discuss benefits versus risk, potential harms that might be associated with certain medications, and really align provider and patient goals so that they're all, everyone's on the same page. Another very clinically relevant and useful tool is ESPERT, or Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. This is a comprehensive, integrated public health approach to delivery of early intervention and treatment services for persons with substance use disorders, as well as those who are at risk of developing these disorders for use in community settings. What is ESPERT and why should you incorporate it into your clinical practice? The screening is a standardized tool to quickly assess risk level. It includes a pre-screen that's universal, followed by a full screen that's more targeted. That is then followed by a brief intervention that helps patients understand their substance use and possible health impacts that it might have and to motivate behavior change. After that is referral to treatment. This helps patients showing signs of a substance use disorder to assess addiction treatment and recovery supports that are available to them. The annual questionnaire is very simple. It can be incorporated into intake paperwork or simply asked verbally, but it consists of four questions and an answer of yes or one or more on any of the questions is indicative of a positive response and additional screening will be needed. If a person tested positive on the initial screening for alcohol, they would then take the audit survey. This is a 10 question survey and the scores on this survey are broken out into four categories, category one, two, three, and four. And this stratifies how bad or severe their alcohol use disorder may be. If they screen positive for drug use on the annual questionnaire, you would then give them the drug screening, screening questionnaire or DAST, which asks them questions about which drugs they may use. Then they have a 10 question assessment and then two other questions, do you inject drugs and have you ever been in a treatment program before? After the screening, you move into a brief intervention, which involves one or more five to 15 minute conversation with a patient. The conversation is designed to enhance the patient's motivation to change their substance use patterns. This consists of feedback about personal risk, explicit advice to change, and there's a big emphasis on the patient's responsibility for change. And this provides a variety of ways to affect that change. So you really have to get the patient's buy-in and use those motivational interviewing techniques for the patient to come up with their own solutions to the problems and challenges that they're facing. Techniques include an empathetic style and support for the patient's perception of self-efficacy or optimism that they can change. If the brief intervention sessions don't successively curb or reduce the substance use and they start to experience serious medical, social, legal, or interpersonal problems associated with their substance use, a referral to treatment is needed. For the average patient population base, that's gonna be roughly 5% of the people that you screen are gonna need a referral to treatment. When you're evaluating risk, the majority of your patients aren't gonna have a substance use disorder or be at very low risk of developing one. There's gonna be other patients that are exhibiting some risky or harmful use behaviors 
And then you're going to have that roughly 5% that are already struggling with some kind of substance use disorder. So the majority of the patients you're going to be working with are going to be in this middle group. So when you're evaluating risk, remember that roughly 75% are low risk or abstinent. So your role is just going to be continuous positive reinforcement. That middle section, or roughly 20%, are likely to experience negative health outcomes from risky or harmful substance use. And this is where those brief interventions are needed and can be very impactful. For those patients outside of that, roughly 5% of the population are going to be dependent and screening the high level of risk. These patients need a referral and more specialized care. So when evaluating risk, it is very important that we know exactly what is one drink. So when talking to your patients, you may be thinking a 12 ounce beer, they may be thinking these kind of beers in these pictures. So make sure that you guys are both on the same page and you know exactly what the definition of one drink is. So let's take a look at what that is. So what is a standard drink? Well, that's typically a 12 ounce bottle of beer. That's gonna be a five ounce glass of wine three ounce glass of fortified wine, such as sherry or port, and 1.5 ounces of liquor. And if you're unsure about those measurements, those red solo cups, those lines that they have on them are intentional. So that first line measures out 1.5 ounces of liquor, that second line, five ounces of wine, and the third line, 12 ounces of beer and the next line up or to the rim is too much of anything. What's more than a standard drink? That's gonna be a pint of draft beer, so those 16 ounce pours. Nowadays with the high gravity beers, that's gonna be a lot of your IPAs. It might be 6% or higher in alcohol content. Any kind of wine cooler or malt liquor, any cocktail such as a martini or bellini, a full red solo cup filled to the top, a cup of jungle juice or a Long Island iced tea or several liquor, liquors all mixed together, or any kind of big gulp cup or styrofoam cup from a fast food restaurant, etc. So in evaluating risk, for men aged 18 to 65, that's going to be four drinks per day and no more than 14 drinks per per week to fall into that low risk category. For women and older adults, that's gonna be three drinks per day and no more than seven drinks in a week. And when we're looking at some adverse consequences of drinking more than these low risk numbers, that involves unintentional injuries, primarily falls, motor vehicle accidents, deaths from external causes, being a target of aggression or taking part in aggression. Think college campuses and associated date rape and binge drinking. You could develop an alcohol use disorder and become physically dependent on alcohol drinking at higher levels. And then negative medical, work, legal, and social consequences. In terms of drug use, any use of a recreational drug is drug misuse. That can be anything methamphetamine, speed, crystal meth, cannabis, marijuana, or pot, and also using any prescription medication for a non-medical reason. All of that is defined as misuse and is a form of drug abuse. When looking at SBIRT in terms of evidence, it's a category B. So what that means is SBIRT is in the top four highest ranking preventative health services available based on health impact, cost, and overall effectiveness. SBIRT is as or more effective as flu shots and cholesterol screenings in terms of health benefit. Not only is SBIRT effective in a category B recommendation, it is a great return on investment. For every $1 spent on SBIRT, the benefit cost ratio is upwards of 5.6 to 1. 
Some examples from across the nation, Wisconsin reduced hospital costs, ED visits, and associated problems, and saw a $1,000 savings per person screened with SBIRT. Texas noted a 50% reduction in alcohol-related injuries. Washington reduced Medicaid-specific expenditures by $185 to $192 per month per patient who received SBIRT. And in California, for every $1 spent on substance misuse treatment, they saw $7 saved in criminal justice and other associated costs. SBIRT services are also reimbursable with CPT and G codes that can be used to bill both Medicaid and Medicare. While the reimbursements aren't earth shattering, I'm sure that most of you are already doing some of this in your practices, so you might as well capture some of the billing and reimbursement that's available for providing SBIRT services. Think of screening for substance use the same as screening for blood pressure or any other chronic disease. If positive, more in-depth assessment is going to be needed. For someone suffering from an alcohol use disorder, low risk drinking limits could be a target to aim for, just like an A1C less than 7 may be a target or goal for someone with diabetes. You always want to provide context for why you're discussing substance use disorders. You want to rule out those with low or no risk and then identify the level of risk for those that you've screened as positive. Patients likely to benefit from a brief intervention and those that might be in need of a referral. When providing a verbal screening, be sure to normalize and set the context and be very transparent as to why you're asking. This can be something as simple as just stating, this is a screening that we provide for all of our patients annually so that they don't think that you're singling them out for any one specific reason. Ask permission and provide the option of not answering a question. Address confidentiality and reassure them that your conversation is confidential and protected by HIPAA privacy laws. If you're doing a verbal screening, use the exact wording provided on the screening instrument. Do not paraphrase. These are validated instruments and they must be read exactly as they are on the screening instrument itself. It's okay to clarify the meaning of an item, but don't paraphrase. When looking at the levels of screening, all patients should receive a pre-screen. This could be at intake annually or during triage. This helps to rule out patients at low or no risk. The universal screening tool is fairly straightforward and an answer of one or more on either the alcohol or drug survey is indicative of a positive response and further screening will be needed. For a patient screening positive on the pre-screen, a full screen will be needed. A full screen for alcohol would be the alcohol use disorder identification test or audit, or a positive for drugs would be the drug abuse screening test or DAST. Each of these screening tools are valid, meaning they measure what we want them to, and reliable, meaning that they measure accurately over a broad group of individuals. The audit was developed by the World Health Organization. Again, it's 10 multiple choice questions. It addresses alcohol only, and it's accurate across many cultures and nations. It's publicly available in multiple languages for free, and scores range from zero to 40. These are the 10 questions, and it breaks it out in levels one, two, three, and four. Let's take a look at the four scoring categories for the audit survey. Remember that roughly 75% of your patients are gonna be in that low risk or have a score of zero to three. Then 20% of your patients are gonna be in level two, which is risky and have a score of four to nine. Then you are gonna have roughly 5% of your patients that are gonna be in the three to four area. So that's 10 and above. These patients are likely gonna benefit most from a referral to treatment but if they're a level three, a brief intervention might bring them down to a level two or level one risk. But if they're in the four or severe category, 14 plus, you need to refer them for more advanced treatment. Taking a look at the DAST or the drug abuse screening test, it addresses drugs only. 
It's validated for screening adults only. It's 10 yes or no questions and provides information on level of use with scores ranging from zero to 10. This is what that survey instrument looks like. And we're looking at the DAS categories, much like with the audit, the majority of your patients are gonna be low risk and have a score of zero. Then roughly 20% may be in that risky category, level two, and score a one to two or answer yes on one to two of the questions on the 10 question survey. Then you've got three to five and six plus for the harmful and severe. And again, level three may benefit from a brief intervention, but if they're six plus or in that severe category, you would typically want to jump straight to preparing them for a referral for treatment. After the screening, some patients may need a brief intervention, and that's a five to 15 minute discussion with two primary aims. Aim one is to ideally enhance a patient's motivation to change their risky or harmful substance use and de-escalate. So reduce drinking, reduce substance use. Aim two, for those that are experiencing negative consequences and can't de-escalate their use, to motivate those patients to seek further assessment and treatment. Brief interventions can have a significant impact on improving the health of not only the person, but the population as a whole. Large numbers of people can be successfully helped with as little as one to two brief intervention discussions with their healthcare provider. Some common goals of a brief intervention session are the opportunity to explore alcohol and drug use and discuss possible reasons for change, to enhance self-efficacy and commitment to that change, to draw upon the natural supports in the person's life, to plant a seed to influence possible change, and to capitalize on a teachable, teachable moment or a positive shift towards the change that the patient and the clinician would like to see. Brief intervention communication is a collaborative effort between a clinician and a patient. It's evoking and elicits the patient's reasons for change. It's also autonomous in the fact that it gives the patient control over the changes that they want to make. Motivational interviewing basics includes an openness to a way of thinking and working that is collaborative rather than prescriptive. It honors the client's autonomy and self-direction and is more about evoking reasons for change than instilling or installing those reasons. This involves at least the willingness to suspend an authoritarian role and to explore client capacity rather than incapacity, so focusing on the positives with a genuine interest in the client's experience and their perspectives. Let's find out what you think about motivation and your beliefs about motivational interviewing. Until a person is motivated to change, there's not much we can do. This is false. Using motivational interviewing techniques will help the patient become motivated and find what motivates them to elicit the change that they want to see in their life. It usually takes a significant crisis or hitting rock bottom to motivate a person to change. While this may be true for some, this is false. Everybody's definition of rock bottom is very different, and unfortunately for some patients that we work with, hitting rock bottom is a fatal overdose. You would think that having had a heart attack would be enough to persuade a man to quit smoking, change his diet, exercise more, and take his medication. You would think that hangovers, damaged relationships, and auto crash, memory blackouts would be enough to convince a woman to stop drinking. You would think losing one's life savings and children's inheritance and slot machines would be enough to help a man quit gambling. You would think that the very real threats of blindness, amputations, and other complications from diabetes would be enough to motivate weight loss and glycemic control. You would think that time spent in the dehumanizing 
privations of prison would dissuade people from reoffending. And yet, so often, it is not enough for people to change. So what is the key to change? Motivation is influenced by human connections. This is absolutely true. Resistance to change arises from deep-seated defense mechanisms. This is also true. People will ultimately choose whether or not they will change. This is also true. Readiness for change involves a balancing of pros and cons. This is true. Creating motivation for change usually requires confrontation. This is false. It doesn't always require confrontation. What it does require is creating a discrepancy, and we'll talk about what that is on subsequent slides. Denial is not a patient problem, it's a skill problem. That's true. If you don't have proper motivational interviewing techniques and skills, it's very hard to overcome a patient's denial that they have a problem in the first place. Client or patient motivation is greatly influenced by the counselor or clinician. This is true. Counselor style strongly drives client resistance. Confrontation drives it up and empathetic listening brings it down. The counselor is one of the biggest determinants of client motivation and change. In terms of motivational interviewing, there are several tasks. And the tasks of MI are to engage through having sensitive conversations with patients, focus on what's important to the patient regarding behavior, health, and their general welfare, evoke the patient's personal motivation for change, and then negotiate plans. Motivating often means resolving con conflicting and ambivalent feelings and thoughts. The spirit of motivational interviewing combines collaboration, autonomy, evocation, and compassion. The spirit of motivational interviewing is collaborative, not confrontational. You develop a partnership in which the patient's expertise, perspectives, and input are central to the consultation. You're fostering and encouraging a power sharing in the interaction. The spirit of MI involves evocation, not education. Motivation for change resides within the patient. It's enhanced by eliciting and drawing on the patient's own perceptions, their experiences, and their specific goals. A great way to evoke this motivation for change is by asking key open-ended questions. It involves autonomy, not authority. Respecting the patient's right to make informed choices facilitates change. The patient is in charge of his or her choices and thus is responsible for the outcomes. Emphasize patient control and choice and foster the patient's right to make informed choices to facilitate their own positive change. The spirit of MI is compassionate. You need to display empathy for the experience of others and your patients. You need to desire to alleviate the suffering of others and be sincere in your empathetic actions. It's a belief and commitment to act in the best interest of the patient. Motivational interviewing is not a way of tricking people into doing what you want them to do. It's also not simply one specific technique or problem solving or skill building. It's not patient centered therapy. It's really not that easy to learn. It takes practice. And it's definitely not a panacea for every clinical challenge.
Motivational interviewing doesn't argue that a person has a problem and needs to change without putting an emphasis on the general acceptance of a problem or diagnosis and eliciting the reasons for making a positive change. It doesn't simply offer direct advice or prescribe a solution without actively encouraging the person to make his or her own choices. It doesn't take an authoritative expert stance and leave the client in a passive role. This is a collaborative effort. It doesn't do most of the talking or act as a unidirectional information system. Rather, the focus is on imparting information and letting the patient make their own decisions and conclusions based on that non-biased information. It doesn't allow the client to determine the content and direction of the counseling. Rather, it makes them a part of it, but the clinician is in control. And it also doesn't behave in a punitive or coercive manner. When using motivational interviewing techniques, it's good to have a general understanding of the writing reflex. So when you look at the left side, that's an external man manifestation of an internal feeling. So when you look at someone who might be angry or agitated, that really means that they're afraid. If they're oppositional, they may be feeling helpless or overwhelmed. If they're discounting, they may be ashamed. If they're defensive, they may feel trapped. If they're justifying, they may be overly disengaged. If they're acting like they're not understood, they might not come back and they'll avoid future interactions with you. If they're feeling like they're not being heard, then they're uncomfortable. And if they're procrastinating, that means that they might just be overly resistant. If they're feeling understood, they're oftentimes more likely to feel safe in their interactions with you. If they want to talk more, then they're feeling empowered. If they like you, they're hopeful. If they're open in their discussions with you, you've made them feel comfortable. If they feel accepted, they're interested in what you're talking about and those positive change that are providing that hopeful feeling for them. If they feel respected, engaged and able to change, they're going to want to come back to see you and they're going to be more cooperative. Motivational interviewing is hard and it's okay. You're not wrestling. It's more of a dance. You don't have to make change happen because you can't. That has to come from the patient. You don't have to come up with all the answers because a lot of times you probably don't have the best ones. So that's why you have to elicit solutions from your patients. You're going to experience ambivalence when you're working with patients and using your motivational interviewing skills. And that's a common response that you'll get. I want to change, but I don't want to change. So that's ambivalence. Very few decisions in life are made with 100% certainty. Ambivalence is normal and part of the change process for everyone. So you can practice this. This is something that we do in a lot of the live presentations. So I'll run through this, and this is just a way that you can practice if you would like to on your own. So you'll need a partner. Each of you will write down something you are interested in doing, but have mixed feelings about. So that could be studying, buying a new car or house, quitting smoking, exercising, anything like that. Select who will speak first, and then the speaker presents what it is that she or he would like to do but haven't done yet. The second person or the listener then argues strongly in favor of one of the options or sides. The speaker, it's your job to listen and note what you are thinking and feeling, and then you'll switch roles. Motivational interviewing is a semi-directive, client-centered counseling style that enhances motivation for change by helping the client clarify and resolve ambivalence about behavior change. 
The goal of motivational interviewing is to create an amplified discrepancy between present behavior and broader goals. So it's to create cognitive dissonance between where they are now and where they want to be. So one example would be a pregnant female who says that they want to have a healthy pregnancy, but they can't give up their marijuana. So that creates a discrepancy. So you just repeat back. So what I hear you saying is you want to have a healthy pregnancy, but you still want to smoke marijuana every day. So just sometimes simply hearing that back, that creates that cognitive dissonance or discrepancy between what the patient says their goal is and what is directly in the way of them reaching that goal. Motivational interviewing is based off four basic principles. Empathy, developing a discrepancy, rolling with overall resistance, and supporting self-efficacy for change. Empathy reflects an accurate understanding and assumes the person's perspectives are understandable, comprehensible, and most importantly, valid. It seeks to understand the person's feelings and perspectives without passing any kind of judgment. Empathy is the first and one of the most important of the four motivational interviewing tenets. Why is it so important? It's because it communicates acceptance, which facilitates change. It encourages a collaborative alliance, with, which also promotes change. It leads to an understanding of each person's unique perspective, feelings, and values, which make up the material we need to facilitate change. We want our patients to make positive change, and empathy is the initial stage in making that possible. Displaying empathy involves a lot of soft skills, and here are some tips to help you display those empathetic responses. Have really good eye contact. Be responsive to both facial expressions and body orientation. Use verbal and nonverbal encouragers. Simple head nods to let them know that you hear them and you're listening. Ask clarifying questions. If you don't understand something, ask so that you guys are on the same page. Avoid expressing doubt and passing judgment. The next motivational interviewing principle is creating a discrepancy between current behavior versus future goals. Sometimes when you drink during the week, you can't get out of bed to get to work. Last month, you missed five days, but you enjoy your work and doing well in your job is very important to you. So this is an example of how you create a discrepancy. One plus one equals three. We know that's not possible. One plus one equals two. So that creates a discrepancy. When creating a discrepancy, it's really important that the person or patient rather than the counselor or clinician present the arguments for change. Change is motivated by a perceived discrepancy between present behavior and important personal goals or values, not the goals and values of the provider or clinician. To create a discrepancy, you really need to find out what the patient values and the importance of values in their life, or you got to find the hook. If values aren't identified, there is no discrepancy, and that's a main component of motivational interviewing. You need to find out what makes their life worth living. What do they value in their life that is affected by the problem or the substance use disorder? What is most important to them? And what gives their life meaning? So try to elicit the values that are going to help you create that discrepancy and help the patient see the value in making and transitioning towards positive change. Some common values or motivators for most people involve general health and well-being, family, romantic relationships, 
career and employment, education or personal development, spirituality. So there's a lot of things that you can discuss that will help you elicit what the patients hold close to them and what their personal or core values consist of. When trying to find that hook or what motivates your patient, there's several things that you can ask or talk about. Ask the patient about their concerns and then provide non-judgmental feedback and information about those concerns. Watch for signs of discomfort with the status quo. And always ask this question, what role, if any, do you think, insert any substance here, play in your health? Let the patient decide. Just asking the question is helpful. And you can see under that hook there, a lot of times patients will say, somebody finally asked me. A lot of patients, no one's even asked them how their substance use disorder plays a role in their health or in their life. And no one's given them that information. So simply asking the question can be very helpful and impactful. Once you've found that hook and identified the values and were able to create a discrepancy, you need to assess the patient's readiness to make a change. This readiness ruler is like a pain scale that's commonly used in the hospital on a scale from one to 10, with one being not ready at all and 10 being completely ready. So you'd simply ask, how ready are you to make any changes in your substance misuse? Then you wanna reinforce the positives. So let's say they marked five. You could say, you marked five, that's great. That means you're 50% ready to make a change. Why did you choose that number and not a lower one, like or a one or a two? Sounds like you have some important reasons for change. Here's another opportunity to practice if you have a partner that you could use to help you with this. So as the speaker, you wanna talk about a change that you're considering, something you were thinking about changing in your life, but have not definitively decided on. It will be something you feel two ways about. It might be a change that would be good for you, that you should make for some reason, but haven't done yet. Tell the interviewer about this change you're considering. As the interviewer second person, don't try to persuade or fix anything. Don't offer advice. Instead, ask these four questions one at a time and listen very carefully to what the person says. First, using open-ended questions, why would you want to make this change? Second, if you did decide to make this change, how might you go about it in order to be successful? Third, what are the three best reasons for you to do it? And then finally, how important would you say it is for you to make this change on a scale from zero to 10 where zero is not at all important and 10 is extremely important. Then follow up that question. And why are you at a certain number rather than a lower number? After you have listened carefully to the answers to these questions, give back a short summary of what you heard of the person's motivations for change. Then ask one final question. So what do you think you'll do? Listen with interest to the answer. Now that we've practiced and are familiar with the readiness ruler and readiness to change, you need to create an action plan. So here's some questions that you can ask to help develop one with your patient. What are some options or steps that will work for you? What do you think you can do to stay healthy and safe? You always want to identify those strengths and supports that will help lift up and support the action plan. Tell me about a time when you overcame challenges in the past. What kinds of resources did you call upon then? Which of those are available to you this time? So all very helpful questions that can help you assess what strengths and supports the patients have. And if they need additional ones, maybe there's references and resources that you can provide.
The third principle of motivational interviewing is rolling with resistance. And I promise you, you'll have to do it. Here's just a simple example. The patient. I don't plan to quit drinking anytime soon. The clinician. You don't think that abstinence would work for you right now. Or the patient says, my husband is always nagging me about my drinking, always calling me an alcoholic. It really bugs me. As a clinician, you can reframe this in a positive way by saying something like, it sounds like he really cares about you and is concerned, although he expresses it in a way that makes you angry. So it's all about rolling with resistance and reframing their ambivalence or resistance to change in a more positive light. During your motivational interviewing sessions, resistance comes in a variety of forms. Some of them are here. It can come in the form of being argumentative, challenging you, discounting your statements, and being overtly hostile towards you. They might interrupt you or talk over you and cut you off. They might just simply ignore you and be non-responsive, not answer your questions, get sidetracked easily and be overall inattentive. They might still be in the denial phase. They might be blaming, minimizing the impact that a substance use disorder has on them. They might be exhibiting a complete unwillingness to make any kind of change. All of these are general manifestations of resistance. Other statements you might hear or that you will hear are things like, look, I don't have a drug problem or something like my cousin was a druggie. I'm not like her. A very common one. I can quit using any time I want to. Oh, I just do it on the weekends. Everybody uses drugs these days. And then this is one that really prevents a lot of people from going into treatment. And it's, I can't handle going through withdrawal. When rolling with resistance, here are a few easy ways to just let it go and not let your entire motivational interviewing session get derailed. I'm not going to push you to change anything you don't want to change. I'm not here to convince you that you have a problem. I'd just like to give you some information and let you make your own decision. I'd really like to hear your thoughts about what you decide to do is ultimately up to you and it's your decision. A way to help roll with resistance and reduce resistance as a barrier is to build rapport. Oars is a way to do that. Use open questioning. Would you mind taking a few minutes to talk with me about your use of whatever? Affirmation, positive statements that can help challenge and overcome self-sabotaging and negative thoughts. I promise you, someone who's suffering from a substance use disorder, they have a lot of self-sabotaging and negative thoughts about themselves, and they need these positive statements and reinforcement. Use reflections. This helps make sure you are on the same page. So reflect back. I hear you saying X, Y, Z to make sure that's exactly what they meant when they said it. Always try to summarize. Will you summarize the steps you will take to change your use of marijuana? I've written down your plan, a prescription for change to keep with you as a reminder. So you need a summary to document what you talked about, what the patient should do, and when they should do it. The use of open-ended questions is key to eliciting those hooks, those values, what motivates your patients, and just learning more about them. So here are some examples of closed versus open-ended questions. So a closed question would be, so you are here because you are concerned about your use of alcohol, correct? The simple response there would be yes or no. That's a closed-ended question that can be answered with a simple yes or no. A better way to ask that question would be, what is it, what is it that brings you here today? 
that makes the patient have to stop and think and give you an answer. How many children do you have? That can be answered with a simple number, zero, one, two, three, whatever that answer is. A better question would be, tell me about your family. Another closed-ended example, did your doctor tell you to quit smoking? Yes or no? A better way to ask that would be, what did your doctor tell you about the health risks of smoking? So all of these help you get to know your patient, help you build rapport, and help develop that relationship with your patient. Here's another exercise that you can do on your own. Just simply read the closed-ended questions and come up with an open-ended question to ask the same thing. So you can run through these on your own and help develop your open-ended questioning style. I know for myself, I drive my wife insane because I haven't asked a closed-ended question and I don't know how long. And there are lots of times when she would just like to say yes or no, but she can't because I asked an open-ended question. You've been practicing your motivational interviewing skills. You performed a stellar brief intervention, but your patient still needs a referral. So that might be to a specialty addiction treatment center that offers psychosocial interventions or maybe medication assisted treatments. It could be simply a referral to support from family, friends, or schools. It might be a faith-based approach or organization that can provide help. Maybe Alcohol uh, Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. It might be a simple peer support group like NA or AA. There's a variety of others, but in order to make a referral, you need to know what referral services are available in your own respective community and how to connect your patients to those services. During your brief intervention, if you know that you're probably going to need to refer someone to treatment, use that brief intervention time to help prepare the patient for specialty care and that referral. Patients with substance use problems often feel ambivalent about seeking specialty treatment. During the brief intervention, use motivational interviewing techniques to build the patient's confidence and willingness to go to a specialty provider before you make that referral. Be prepared for the referral. Be able to answer these questions. Who do you call? What form do you fill out if you need to make a referral? Who on your team can help you set up an appointment? Maintain an up-to-date roster of public and private treatment and peer support resources in your community. If nothing else, be sure that you can connect them with their local regional overdose prevention specialists or ROPES. Here's a listing. If you wanna print this map out, you can go to Google and just type in TN space ROPS, and it's one of the first links that comes up. This is broken out into regions, and you'll see here, these are their personal email addresses and cell phone numbers. These regional overdose prevention specialists are also peer recovery support specialists, meaning they themselves have suffered with a substance use disorder in the past. So they've been where these people are and they can help them on their recovery journey. Other readily available resources include the Tennessee Red Line, the Statewide Crisis Line, and the Tennessee Recover App. All of these are great resources that you can offer to your patients and at bare minimum, please connect them to the local regional overdose prevention specialist that's familiar with all the resources that are available in their respective communities. There are several challenges or barriers to people seeking and receiving treatment, and one of the biggest ones is stigma. Reasons people 18 and older who needed but did not get treatment, some of the biggest ones 
and most common are they're concerned about being committed or having to take medication. It might have negative effects on their job. They might get fired. Might cause neighbors or community to have a negative opinion of them. They might be concerned about confidentiality or they simply don't want others to find out. Another challenge to overcoming any kind of substance use disorder is access to willing providers. A survey of providers showed that 47.4% accept patients and provide psychiatric services. That's less than half of all providers. 32.6% accept patients believing psychiatric symptoms will resolve with abstinence of substance use. 19.3% refer to mental health providers and then accept those patients back once they're stabilized. And then 13% refer to a more capable addiction program. So when it comes to finding and receiving treatment, access to competent, willing providers is definitely a barrier and a challenge. Tennessee is in a mental health care health professional shortage area, or an HPSA. That means that based on this map back in 2018, at best case scenario, we could meet 45.25% of the mental health care needs in our state. So just keeping that really simple, out of every 100 people that need treatment, only 45 of those are gonna get treatment. Naloxone is a tool that offers the opportunity to help slow our death rate and save lives of people that might be experiencing an opioid overdose. Pharmacist distribution of naloxone is a promising and tangible form of harm reduction, and this is where pharmacists licensed and practicing in the state of Tennessee are authorized under a valid statewide collaborative pharmacy practice agreement executed by the chief medical officer to dispense an opioid antagonist without a patient specific prescription. This is also now allowable in all 50 states. So this is a way that patients that might be at risk for an opioid overdose or loved ones of those that might be can simply go to a pharmacy, ask for naloxone and get that prescription filled without seeing a provider first. Now let's take a look at the ROPES training provided by the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services on opioid information and overdose prevention training and exactly the role you can play in helping reduce our overdose death rate and potentially save a life. To start, what are opioids? Opioids is a broad general term for any drug that binds to the opioid receptors in the brain. This can include illegal drugs as well as prescription medications used for pain. On the left side, you'll see some common names of opioids, codeine, morphine, methadone, hydrocodone. And on the right side, you'll see the commonly associated street names for those same drugs. What is the opioid epidemic? Well, every day, more than 130 people in the United States die directly from an opioid overdose. 67% of those deaths involve a synthetic opioid like fentanyl. In 2018, more people died from an opioid overdose than car accidents in the United States. The Center for Disease Control estimates the economic burden of prescription opioid misuse in the U.S. to be around $78.5 billion a year. What causes an overdose? Opioids affect the brain's regulation of breathing. They perfectly mimic the body's natural transmitters, allowing them to fit exactly on the brain's receptors. So in that picture, the gray squiggly lines represent mu receptors or those opioid receptors in your brain. If you just have three of those, if an opioid, one of the blue circles, sits down on one of those receptors, your respiratory rate would drop by a third. When a second one occupied another one, your respiratory rate would drop by two thirds. 
And when a third blue circle came in and occupied that last receptor, that's when you would stop breathing. Once attached, opioids block the perception of pain, but do nothing to actually treat what's causing the pain. And they also slow down that respiratory rate. Overdoses occur when too many opioids attach, causing breathing to completely stop. This lists some common risk factors for an opioid overdose. And in the upper left-hand box, that's where we typically see the most of our overdoses occurring after a period of no use. So this might be someone who was in jail, went through a detox program, or was recently released or is currently in a rehab or treatment facility. So what happens here is remember, tolerance develops for opioids and there's no ceiling effects. So those doses increase indefinitely forever to maintain pain control or euphoria or just allow a person with a chronic opioid use disorder just to function. So that tolerance develops over time, but it goes away relatively quickly after a period of no use. So after jail, detox, or rehab, a person will return to using their normal dose, and now that will consist of a fatal overdose because they're no longer tolerant. We also see overdoses with mixing opioids with other drugs, especially alcohol and benzodiazepines, which we've discussed extensively. If they have a history of addiction, a previous overdose, or if they're using while alone and there's no one to administer Narcan or Naloxone or call for help. If someone has suicidal ideations, they may be intentionally overdosing. If they have any mental illness, other chronic disease states which can complicate respirations like COPD, or if they have a methadone prescription because methadone is a direct agonist and works on those same mu receptors in the brain and if they're using methadone and add another opioid on top of that that might push them over the edge and cause them to overdose harm reduction is a way of preventing disease and promoting health that meets people where they are this can be with heart disease diabetes, a substance use disorder, any kind of chronic disease. Not everyone is always ready or able to stop drug use. Therefore, scientifically proven ways of decreasing risk are essential. And some examples of those are medicated assisted treatments or therapies, naloxone or Narcan, syringe services programs, medications for opioid use disorder, so there's a lot of scientifically proven ways to help decrease risk and help people on their recovery journeys. Harm reduction core principles involve a non-judgmental approach. Behavior change is an incremental process and can take time. You wanna focus on enhancing the quality of someone's life. There's complex social factors that influence vulnerability to drug use and drug-related harm. Those can be poverty, social inequality, discrimination, adverse childhood effects or events, and other trauma. You wanna empower those who use drugs to be the primary agents in reducing the harms of their drug use. So utilize those motivational interviewing skills. Syringe services program play a key role in harm reduction. These are community-based public health programs that provide comprehensive harm reduction services in addition to providing unused needles and syringes. They provide safe disposal containers for needles and syringes, HIV and hepatitis testing and linkage to treatment, education about overdose prevention and safer injection practices, referral to substance use disorder treatment, referral to medical, mental health, and social services, and tools to prevent HIV, STD, and viral hepatitis. It's known that people that access and utilize syringe service programs re reduce their drug use over time. 
people who inject drugs that use these services are five times more likely to enter treatment for substance use disorder when participating. That's because all of the social services that the community has to bear to help and assist their, retreat, their recovery and treatment are there at the SSP. So when they're ready to access treatment, the resources are there and available. They're more likely to reduce or stop injecting when they use an SSP. Syringe Services Program reduced needle stick injuries among first responders by providing proper disposal. This also keeps used needles out of our public bathrooms and parks that helps reduce general risk to the community at large. It also reduces HIV and hepatitis C incidents and overdose deaths. Remember, the economic burden of this, roughly $78.5 billion annually. Now there's a treatment for hepatitis C. Just like if you have hypertension or diabetes, when you go to jail, and we know that people who inject drugs are more likely to end up incarcerated than those who, who don't, if you end up in jail and you have hepatitis C, which is a chronic insidious liver disease that leads to cirrhosis and subsequently death, there's a cure for that. So you can't be denied a life-saving treatment or therapy just because you're incarcerated, but those people might not have any ability to pay for those treatments. On average, one course of hepatitis C treatment ranges between eighty and $120,000. So if we can prevent people from contracting hepatitis C and having to pay for that through tax dollars once they're incorporated by exchanging used needles for unused needles and lowering the likelihood of contracting and spreading hepatitis C and HIV, that is the way that SSPs are providing those harm reduction initiatives and services. These are just the laws that make syringe services programs legal in the state of Tennessee. Tennessee Code 4070-124 makes possession of needles allowable if a person is actively involved in a syringe services program. If not, hypodermic needles and other sharp objects on the person are deemed drug paraphernalia. Also, the Safe Syringe Act allows for syringe services to operate and for the disposal of needles, security, educational materials, and access to naloxo, naloxone referral to treatment. So any non-governmental -gov agency approved by the Department of State may operate an SSP. And these are just the laws that make these organizations and setups possible. So things to leave with the public, and this is for healthcare practitioners and more specifically law enforcement. The syringe services program here in Knox County provides this brown bag, and in this op opioid overdose rescue kit is two vials of naloxone and a syringe and needle that you attach via Luralock to withdraw the naloxone and inject that intramuscularly. Now, the most common form in the community is the Narcan or nasal spray. The reason we use the vials is due to cost and people who are injecting drugs are familiar with the use of needles and how to draw up medications and inject. So for from a cost perspective, this is much more economical and this patient population is comfortable and familiar using these devices. These are what the syringes look like. They're simple insulin syringes. They're pennies on the dollar. And in comparison to what it costs to treat an ongoing HIV infection or hepatitis C infection, the cost of these needles, needles pales in comparison. They may also be carrying on their person a syringe services program participant identification card. This is very useful to identify them as someone who's using this service so that their syringes and other things aren't dr deemed drug paraphernalia and confiscated by officers or putting them in an awkward position legally. 
There are several syringe services programs in the state. This is a map that details where they're located. So there's some in Washington County, Cock County, Knox County, Hamilton County, which is Chattanooga, Davidson County, which is Nashville, and Shelby County, which is Memphis. Reducing stigma is also a goal, and this slides in here to show that over 50% of opioid prescriptions for pain in Tennessee were paid for using insurance. So what that means is to have a commercial insurance plan, you typically have to be gainfully employed because a lot of times we think about people who are misusing opioids or have an opioid use disorder as being junkies or some other stigmatizing name. But in most instances, these are people that are holding down a job, going to work regularly, and they might be physically dependent. And if more than that, they might be misusing and abusing. And I can tell you from personal experience, working in a pharmacy and also volunteering in a syringe services program, there are patients that fill opioids at pharmacies who also exchange needles at a syringe services program. So what that tells me is their misuse and abuse probably started somewhat innocently with an opioid prescription. And now because of uh, the limited supply, hydrocodone going from C3 to C2, they're being maintained on an opioid prescription that just isn't enough and they're supplementing with heroin. How do you recognize an overdose? An opioid overdose is going to slow everything down. They're going to stop breathing. Their pupils will contract and appear to be very small. This is a telltale sign that it's opioid related. They may nod out, um, their speech may be slurred, they may be out of it, but if they're not breathing and they're unresponsive and you have Narcan or Naloxone available, administer it. And we'll talk about how to do that and when to do that on the next few slides. So what is naloxone specifically? Naloxone is the only successful way to reverse an opioid overdose. It reverses the effects of opioids by binding to the same sites more powerfully than opioids. They have a higher affinity for those receptors and can remove those blue circles or opioids from those gray receptors. It knocks the opioids off those sites and temporarily restores breathing. And per the package insert, that can be restored for 30 to 90 minutes. What we see actually out in the field due to increasing potencies and in heroin laced with fentanyl is more of a 10 to 15 minute reversal. But 10 to 15 minutes is still enough to buy time for EMS to arrive to provide additional naloxone and medical support. It is not possible to overdose on naloxone. Naloxone only has effect in the body if there are opioids occupying those mu receptors in your brain. Otherwise, there's no pharmacologic effect and there's no adverse side effects of using naloxone. There are four different variations that you might run across out in the community. The one on the left is what's contained in most syringe service program kits. It's also the form that will likely be used by EMS. They'll withdraw it from the vial and in, in, inject that into a muscle or an IV if they have IV access. The next one over is the Evzio device. This is an auto injecting device while this is discontinued and no longer being manufactured and all the units should be expired, you may still come across one of these. And the way I view this is even if it's expired, having some expired medication is better than no medication. So just be aware that you might come across some of these, but they're no longer sold and all the units that are out there in existence have since expired. The next one over is the Narcan nasal spray. That's what's provided by the ropes across the state. This is also the form that is uh, 
nasally used, so it's very user-friendly. The layperson can figure out exactly how to use this, and we'll talk about how to do that on the next slides. And then on the far right side, that's a CapuJet system. This is something that might be found in a crash cart, and before there was a nasal form uh, FDA approved in the form of Narcan, you'll see there was a cone that could be put on there, a nasal atomizer, to turn this CapuJet system into a nasal aerosolization system. Some common naloxone misconceptions. There is absolutely no evidence that giving people naloxone makes them more likely to use more drugs. Naloxone keeps people alive. And remember, Going through withdrawal is painful and unpleasant, and naloxone will put someone in full-blown withdrawal. So a lot of the side effects and things that you see after giving naloxone is manifesta manifestations of that withdrawal syndrome. Research shows injection drug users trained on naloxone reduce use over time and increase knowledge and overdose response behavior. No one would give or administer naloxone or Narcan if they weren't protected from civil and criminal liability. So there's a standing order in Tennessee, anyone may obtain naloxone directly from a pharmacist, and we've talked about this, without an individualized physician's prescription. There's also the Tennessee Addiction Treatment Act, and this applies to the person who overdosed and anyone in the immediate vicinity. So any person seeking medical attention for themselves or someone else after an overdose has immunity from prosecution for a drug violation on the person's first drug overdose. So for the person that overdosed, they basically get a get, a, get out of jail free card. After that, it's up to the officer whether or not they want to take that person to jail on a subsequent overdose. But the main thing here is other people are protected from casual use and exchange and having drugs at the scene because no one's going to call for help if they're going to get in trouble or be arrested or go to jail when law enforcement arrives. And law enforcement are typically, other than the fire department, one of the first responders on the scene that carry naloxone and can help save that person's life. There's also the Tennessee Good Samaritan Act, and this allows any person to administer naloxone in good faith to a person experiencing an opioid overdose who has received basic instruction evidenced by a certificate. So by doing this training right now, that is basic instruction, and you can go to the Tennessee's uh, Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services website and print out a certificate that shows that you've been trained and you can administer naloxone or Narcan to a person in need. So an example of harm reduction in action. In the event of an opioid overdose, prevent death by providing naloxone or Narcan if you have it. Call 911 immediately to get the victim needed medical attention. Assess their needs. Is there a treatment service that's appropriate or desired? What experiences, both positive or negative, may influence their willingness to utilize these services? So after someone's overdose and been rescued, the ropes are available, there's recovery navigators in hospitals and ERs to help provide that warm handoff into a treatment service if that's where the, if the person's ready to accept that type of care and treatment. Have a conversation about overdose prevention, carrying naloxone, and safer drug use strategies. Responding to an opioid overdose, there's some several steps. Step one, try to maintain responsiveness and keep them awake. Call the person's name, shake the person, use the sternal rub. You make a fist in the middle joints of your fingers, not the knuckles to firmly rub the center of the person's chest to wake them up. If the person doesn't respond, move on to step two. Step two involves administering naloxone. 
Most commonly used form of naloxone is the Narcan nasal spray. And if you have this, there's some storage recommendations. So you should store it at general room temperature, 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you're carrying it on your person or in your car or in your purse, excursions above 77 degrees Fahrenheit aren't ideal, but it's not gonna inactivate the product. While it might not be 100% effective, it might be 95% effective. But if the Narcan freezes, it's inactivated. So in the summer months, that's not such a, a big deal, but in the winter months, if you're gonna be carrying it in your car or someplace where it might freeze, keep it next to a water bottle. And if the water's frozen, that means your Narcan froze too. You need to get rid of it because it's inactive. The nasal form of naloxone is relatively easy to use. It comes in a blister type pack packaging. You peel the back to remove the device. You hold the device with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and two fingers on the nozzle, like pictured. You place and hold the tip of the nozzle in either nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of the patient's nose. Then with one firm press, you press the plunger firmly to release the dose into the patient's nose. Unlike other nasal sprays that are over the counter, Afrin or anything like that, you might have to pump it a few times to prime the bottle before any medication comes out. Don't do that with this device. This comes already primed and ready to use. If you do try to prime it, you'll waste some, if not all of the dose. If the person's symptoms return after the first dose, an additional dose may be given after two to three minutes. If after you gave the dose, they're still non-responsive, wait two to three minutes, then give another dose. What you're gonna do is you're gonna continue this pattern until you're out of naloxone or Narcan or EMS or first responders have arrived and taken over the scene. Step three, dial 911. Stay with that person until emergency medical services arrive. Tell the 911 operator your address or location, where to find the person, if breathing has slowed or stopped, if you gave naloxone and how much or how many doses, and what medications you think the patient may have taken. Steps two and three can occur interchangeably depending on which can be achieved more quickly, but you should administer the Narcan as soon as possible and then typically dial 911. You can put the 911 operator on speakerphone and just listen to their instructions, but don't delay the administration of the naloxone or Narcan because if it's an opioid induced respiratory depression, remember naloxone is the only drug that can reverse that. If they still don't respond, you may need to give CPR, but there's really an emphasis on providing high quality compressions and not relying so much on the two breaths. So we know that there's oxygenated blood already in the person's system. It just needs to be pumped to their brain. And also when you exhale fully, there's still about 15 to 20% of residual lung volume that you can exhale. So there's still some oxygen in their lungs. The most important part of this is giving high quality compressions and pumping that oxygenated blood to their brain. Place the individual in the recovery position if you need to leave them for any reason. Also, if they start to respond after that initial dose of Narcan, roll them over in the re recovery position because one of the most common things that happens is they might vomit. So roll them over, make sure that if they do vomit, they don't inhale that back down into their lungs or aspirate and cause further complications with their breathing. Stay and watch the individual. They may have no memory of overdosing at all. They might be reversed and be talking to you just like I'm talking to you right now, like it never even happened. That kind of reversal was more common 
six to eight years ago, but now with the increase in potency of products that are available, we're seeing less of a reversal. And in most cases, all we're getting is just shallow respirations until EMS can arrive to provide a bag device and further symptomatic care. You want to comfort the individual. Naloxone triggers an opioid withdrawal syndrome or symptoms, and this can be very, very uncomfortable. And in some cases, people feel like they might be dying. You want to help that individual remain calm and discourage using more opioids for at least two hours. Because remember, they're gonna be in full-blown withdrawal and really the only thing that can make them feel better and take that away is using more opioids. But continued opioid use will not help with the withdrawals because the Narcan's on board and it's blocking those receptors. You wanna encourage that individual to receive treatment from paramedics, and they really need to go to the hospital for symptomatic and supportive care. Let the paramedics know when they arrive, tell them that the naloxone might have been administered, tell them how much and approximately what time you gave it. If known, tell them what substance the individual took and how much that will help them better treat the patient on the way to the hospital. Remember, the naloxone itself doesn't really have after effects and what you're seeing are manifestations of withdrawal. And naloxone will only last best case scenario, 30 to 90 minutes. Opioids can stay in a person's system for hours. A second opioid overdose can occur, especially if the individual takes more opioids due to withdrawal symptoms. Naloxone may cause an individual to experience some of the following withdrawal symptoms. They might be violent or irrational, projectile vomit, have a cardiovascular event if they have underlying pre-existing heart conditions, or experience intense musculoskeletal pain. Treatment, recovery, and social services are available, and for information and to become connected to these resources, text SAVE to 30678, and resources on contact information for each region are contained in the Tennessee Recover app. These are also some resources that we've highlighted previously, the Tennessee Red Line, the Statewide Crisis Line, and then again, the Tennessee Recover app. As part of the naloxone training, there's a brief assessment, and we'll go through these questions together. So what forms of naloxone are available? Intranasal, intramuscular, both intranasal and intramuscular, or none of these? The correct answer here is C, both A and B. We have the intranasal form and we also have the intramuscular form. A second dose of naloxone may be necessary before EMS arrival. That is absolutely true. If you've given a first dose and they haven't responded after two to three minutes, give a second dose if you have it. You should give the naloxone and leave the patient alone. That's false. If for any reason you do have to leave the patient, always roll them over into the recovery position first. When administering intramuscular naloxone, where is the best location to give the injection? Is that in the chest, in the outer thigh, in the arm, or in the stomach? Well, if you're using the Evzio device or an auto injector, in the outer thigh would be the preferred place. And typically, if you're giving an intramuscular injection, that's gonna be the place. It's a large muscle group, it's hard to miss, and it's gonna get the medication where it needs to go. How long does naloxone last? Well, per the package insert, it's gonna be 30 to 90 minutes, and that's gonna be best case scenario. What we're seeing out in the field is more like 10 to 15 minutes max, but per the package insert, you can expect to see 30 to 90 minutes in a best case type scenario. Naloxone is an addictive substance. 
This is false. Remember, naloxone has no pharmacologic activity unless there are opioids activating those mu receptors in someone's brain. How do you de determine when someone is overdosing? The patient is unresponsive even after a sternal rub. Yep, that's one of them. The patient has shallow breathing or is not breathing. Absolutely. They're pale or have clammy skin. Yep. Their skin might be turning blue, especially around the lips and fingernails. Absolutely. They may have extremely small pinpoint pupils. Yep. So that's all of the above. Call 911 as soon as you sp suspect an overdose. That is absolutely true. Anytime you come across anyone who's unre unresponsive, quickly call 911 to get supportive care there as soon as possible. Chest compressions or CPR may be necessary. Absolutely. If you come across someone who's unresponsive and you give them naloxone or Narcan, you wait two to three minutes, they still don't wake up and you're out of Narcan, give chest compressions or CPR. What law protects you from civil liability when administering naloxone to someone you suspect is overdosing? Is that the Tennessee Addiction Treatment Act? The Good Samaritan Act? the Overdose Prevention Act or Protection Act, or none of the above. That's going to be B. The Good Samaritan Act protects you from civil liability. Remember, the ROPES are a great resource, those regional overdose prevention specialists. They've distributed over 170,000 units of naloxone across the state of Tennessee since October 2017. Naloxone has saved over 17,000 lives in Tennessee since 2017, and this is a relatively conservative estimate based on the reported uses of naloxone. This doesn't include those times it was administered and not reported, which we suspect is numerous. To help better evaluate lives saved, please, if you have Narcan, complete the overdose reversal form available online, and the link to that is below. How to access naloxone? Remember, most pharmacies have engaged in a collaborative pharmacy practice agreement where they can dispense naloxone or Narcan without a prescription. The Narcan nasal spray specifically, 80% of commercial plans have a copay of $20 or less. It's available at CVS, Walgreens, and some other pharmacies without a prescription. Most pharmacies will dispense it without a prescription, and most independent pharmacies are more likely to than some of the larger chains in some instances. The FZO naloxone auto-injector used to be free with commercial insurance, but remember, that's been removed from the market. And if you don't have insurance, the Narcan nasal spray is absolutely free, no cost from your regional overdose prevention specialist or local anti-drug coalition. Average cash prices at Walgreens are around $136, CVS around $90, and coupons are available for drugstores at goodrx.com. Contact information for your regional overdose prevention specialist. The link is here. It's really easy. Just Google TNROPS and it'll be the first thing that pops up in your search bar. Here's another map or listing of your regional overdose prevention specialists. Here's additional references and resources. That concludes our training, and I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to learn more about the opioid epidemic and the role you can play in harm reduction and making each of our communities a safer place. Thanks again. 
If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is bwinbiggle at uthsc.edu. That's B-W-I-N-B-I-G-L at uthsc.edu. Thanks again. I-G-L at uthsc.edu. Thanks again.